Folks, hello and welcome to Talking Crit. I am Eric Tinker, one half of your regular host of Talking Crit. With me, uh, for real this week, none other than Bad Mike, my once a week work spouse. And with us, if you were here last week, you saw Bill in the role of Mike, but now Bill is here in the role of Bill Barr, Pace Setter Games. Bill, yep. welcome. Oh my God, Kurt Gold yep. is in the room. Thank you. Oh, and, uh, hey. I'm sorry, hey, your Bill. your fans. You have to see me twice. Uh -oh. No, no. Thanks for you know what. Thank you for tagging in next last week. I I could not have done the show. I I was in horrible shape for those that saw the first five shape. minutes. So it's ten days later. I am still probably going to have to hit the mute button a few times when I, when I cough because I the here's the worst part. I cough when I laugh. So you guys, I mean, I know you're not normally oh. funny. You're, you're not at all. No, I mean, just not, take, not, not, not one bit. <coughs> I'll probably make myself laugh, though, because I'm funny. I'm funny, and I'll make myself laugh, and then I'll cough. Um, but, yeah, it's a, that's the legacy of Gary Khan, and uh, I had a great time well, at Gary Khan. We could talk, we'll uh, talk about that a little bit. I like that. And that's yikes. the legacy of Gary Khan. <laughs> <laughs> he has nobody oh, apologies has to any idea. We'll get, we'll get back to that. We'll get, we'll get that. Well, we got a, we have a lot of stuff to talk about. We're gonna so we're gonna start talking about, and I want to I want to say kudos to Bill because last week it was about Scott Swift and his Kickstarter, but yep. uh, Bill had talked just about his Kickstarter. So you know what? Since you showed so much restraint last week and didn't pimp your own Kickstarter, we're gonna talk about your Kickstarter this week. But it's not a Kickstarter. And, you know, well, you're. It's, I know. So and that's thing. that fine. that's part of the discussion we'll probably have, right? Oh, there it is. There you go. Oh yeah, there we are. Um, so anyway, yeah, it's uh, it's a Kickstarter. It's not a Kickstarter. It's on Backerkit crowdfunding. So this is our Backerkit. Yes, a lot yeah, of a our, lot of people are doing that. Ever, uh, our first ever crowdfunding with them. Um, we've been with Backerkit for about ten years. We've used them for fulfillment, uh, our full, somewhat fulfillment end, um, ever since they've pretty much been in business. Um, we. Uh, uh, it, I'll get sidetracked everywhere instead of talking about the actual project. But um, so uh, Backer Kit came to us a little over a year ago. Um, and obviously, not just us, but probably several other people have been with them a long time. Said, hey, we're putting a crowdfunding platform together. We want to have you guys, you know, we'd love you to be a part of it. And I was in this kind of a select group they had in a, like a seminar and or meeting. And we just didn't have a project ready because they've been doing this for almost a year. I, I don't think a full a year, year. Of that. Yeah, about a year. Yeah, we for, just did a project. They're, they're, they've been doing this a lot lately. Um, we had Bunny and Zane oh, on yeah, last year, and, and they did a backer kit. A lot of people are are right. They they were one of the first ones. So mm -hmm. um, a lot of people are, are starting to migrate over there. Look, I, I can, I've always extolled the virtues of backer kit. They are, uh, it's a great platform for the fulfillment end. Um, I mean, we still mail all our own books, but everything else we go through them, like, you know, all our mm -hmm. ship, uh, billing for shipping right. and add-ons and uh, PDF distribution, all that goes through Backerkit. Um, the one thing I, I will say is that um, their customer service is exemplary. It is absolutely superb. Um, but like, I mean, if you have a question, you, you can shoot them an email. They don't get back to you three weeks later like Kickstarter does. And then when Kickstarter gets back to you, they never actually answer your questions. So you got to email it again. Right. Um, I mean, they get back to you if it, usually the same day, and unless you email them really late in the day and then it's first thing in the morning. They've called us. Like if it's a, if it's a little more complexity going on, they'll say, can I set up a time to call you? That's customer service. Okay. That's that's Absolutely. what you're looking for. Yeah. Um, with uh, And again, I'm not – I'm going to be – Clear. We're not leaving Kickstarter. We're also using backer kit crowdfunding. We so have a project. A coming up. Yeah, yeah. Give we're a we have a project coming up that's going on Kickstarter, and the reason we waited kind of this long to get on a, a, a backer kit crowdfunding one is because we wanted the right kind of project. We wanted to be fair to them, fair to us, uh, because it is a new platform, and not mm -hmm. everyone is going to rush out and back something. Because let's face it, when you make things harder on people, they tend to not do it right. So. You know, if they don't already have an account with Backerkit, they're like, oh, now I got to fill out an account and I got to keep track of another, you know, crowdfunding platform instead of Kickstarter where all my stuff's always been. So, you know, there's going to be a, 
it's going to take a couple of years, three years, probably for backer kit to get enough of a footprint. They also don't have the, you know, the uh, customer base that Kickstarter has. Um, so, you know, right. all that said, we really, we've been talking about this for a long time when we finally got this launched and we decided to go with the, our Endless Encounters book. Our first one uh, that we did was our best crowdfunding project ever. And that was with Kickstarter. Um, so we just wanted something we knew we would have some success with uh, to try this out. That said, we know we're not going to have the success. If I put this on Kickstarter, I could tell you right now, we'd probably be uh, a lot farther ahead, but we don't care about that right now. We care about getting this going. And uh, you gotta, you But the book's doing great. Yeah. We're doing absolutely no complaints whatsoever. We're happy with the launch. Um, uh, we're doing, like I said, we're doing really well. It's great working with Backer Kit. They've been in contact with us ever since we started this thing. I mean, Kickstarter, you would never hear from them ever right. <laughs> when you launch a project. It's, it's like a ghost town there. Um, so, but any, and, and uh, I could talk about the project if you want a little bit. Now that I got all that behind well, the curtain. So, so you had your, uh, you had your, I remember your dungeon encounters. Book, so, yeah. Is, so, Endless Encounters which Dungeons is, great, right? is our yes. first book. Yeah. Awesome. Book. That was, awesome. Uh, uh, it's, and, so you guys get an idea. This is Endless Encounter Dungeons. Uh, it's a 260 or 70. This is the PX but, version. Hold on. By the way, Bill. That Bill, I don't know. I don't. I don't here. know if you know this. I don't know if you know this, Bill. Yeah. Um. Do you, Do you know who uses that? Uh, when everybody. They, uh, uh, a guy that you might know. His name is uh, Steve Winter. I know. That. Yes. He told yeah. me. Uh, it's awesome. I didn't want, I'm glad you're name dropping. Uh, Eric, you can pull me off the, the whole thing now. I drop it. Uh, I don't want to name drop. I don't like do next. I don't want to say someone's endorsing our project, but there are, yeah, there are several uh, old TSR guys that use this book, but then the BX version. Uh, yep. specifically. We haven't BX 5E, but so what What this book is, is it's, a, it's an encounter generator and you can do it. Um, you can do it on the fly or you can do it as dungeon prep, however you want to wilderness encounter prep um so this one is all about wilderness mostly woods and forests mostly um but uh you can you know you always got people you're in the town but you got to go to the dungeon and the dungeon's 20 miles away through the woods well if you want to generate some encounters for your pcs this is the book to do it it's level based so you can generate the encounter based on the level of the characters going through it so you're not going to get to you know you're going to get some uh uh wild diversity of encounter here by the way we don't call it endless encounters for nothing you will you can roll through these charts you are never going to get the same result twice it's just yeah i know never is a strong word but in in all reality of playing playing this game you're never going to encounter something like this twice and it's not just a a wandering monster book i think mike you're a little familiar with it 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 there are charts that flow chart your way through the your encounter that start with the basics like you know, where are you? What does it look like? What kind of environment is it? And then we go under like, you know, have you stumbled upon some ruins? Have you found an old tower? Have you found like a magical gate? Are all kinds of stuff that you can stumble across in the woods. And then it just details from there. Like if you find a gate, what does the gate do? Um, I think a better example, like maybe you find a statue, right? So you find a statue in the woods, but we don't, we don't just leave it at that. You know, we have the, the chart, Directs you where to go next because the players are always going to ask these questions. Well, what's the statue of? Well, believe me, there's a chart. Once you establish there's a statue, is the statue of a god? Is it of just some monster? Is it of a humanoid? If it is, it takes you to the next chart, which shows which details what god is it. Okay, and then you can even determine what the statue's made out of, what color it is. Is there a monster around it? Is there a treasure around it? This book does all this stuff, and I know I'm taking a long time to explain it. But it, you can do this in literally minutes of die rolls um, or prep time ahead of time and build an entire adventure using this book. I mean, it's it's going to be big. It's going to be 220, 240 pages at the end of the day. Uh, again, it's level based. So you if you have a bunch of first level uh, characters running through the woods, you are going to you're going to stay in basically chapter one, uh, which is levels one through three and then um, go from there now. Uh, for those of you familiar with dungeons and dun in Endless Encounters Dungeons, uh, same thing was level based. When you got to rolling the monsters, like if there's, let's say there's a monster in the encounter, we had a chart with level uh, one to 100, and we had 100 different monsters 
that you can roll under uh, just in one chart. We've changed it up in Wilderness where now we have a, your first chart you're gonna go to if there's a creature encountered is just a creature type chart. And there's a, about a dozen of them, anything from animals to dinosaurs, to dragons, to undead, slimes, molds, oozes, um, all that kind of stuff. You're gonna roll that and then, you're gonna, then it's gonna take you to another chart to like, if you roll, you, you, you determine it's a humanoid. It'll take you to the humanoid chart then you'll roll into the humanoids and pull a humanoid monster out. So there's even more options or availability to get monsters in this thing. Um, I know Bob G saying we need an automated version. You're talking to the wrong guy. Uh, <laughs> it would be awesome, but uh, we would have to have someone do that. That's not our skill set, and we love books, so that's why it's in book form. But um, so that's it in a, in a kind of in a really tight nutshell. Um, but there's also so much more in this book. There's it's pace setter. So you've got, I think at last count, we got like 46 or 47 new monsters in here. There's going to be more based on some stretch goals and that kind of thing. Uh, same thing with new magic items. There's 40 plus new magic items in here. There's new spells in here. Uh, there's a new character class for BX. And then there's class options for the 5e version. Um, and then we have sample encounters in here for every level. So uh, it's a comprehensive book. Again, it's uh, for 50 bucks. You're going to get something that I know you're going to use again and again for years. And that's what people have told us with Endless Encounter Dungeons. That book's been out for three years now. We have people come to our booth all the time and say they use it all the time at their game sessions. You, you want to use it for most, Bill, as when I, I run into a random encounter, I want to roll treasure. Because I don't yeah. sit there. I, I, look, I love AD and D, but I don't like to roll on the, on the treasure type, whatever the hell. I'll just, yeah. I just like to make make one roll. Okay, you searched all the dead goblins. You found ninety three silver pieces, seventy five copper pieces. Okay, there you go. And so I I use that's what I use the dungeon adventures for the most. I would say. Yeah. Like treasure, well, treasure with this one, we did the same thing with treasures. We broke it up a little bit more, but not not into like the the DMG detail, but. Um, we did break it up a little bit more. So first you're gonna roll on type of treasure and then you're gonna roll on one sub chart to see what you get. But, um, and that's the beauty of this book. You can use it as little as you want or as much as you want. If you wanna use it just for a wandering monster chart, hell, use it for wandering monster charts. It's great, it can do all that, but it can do it, again, it does a whole lot more and it, it's there to make your life easier as a DM. That's, you know, in, in, in Pace Setters Creed, we're gonna innovate and uh, as part of everything we do, and we are going to make sure whatever product you buy from us, um, it makes your job easier as a DM. If we're not doing that, then we, we know we failed. And we know these Endless Encounter books absolutely deliver there. Um, and uh, I, I think that's that's it, like I said, in, in a nutshell. The, I know the Kickstarter describes all of it. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, I just saw something flash by. What's classic? So we have two versions of this book. We have a 5e version. that speaks for itself. If you play 5e, you select a 5e book when you go to um, the backer kit end uh, of fulfillment and you just pick whatever book you want. And then we have what's called a classic. It's a classic D&D book. Classic nice. for us, what we've done is we've taken basically homes through black box and made a what we call classic D&D stat block. So any version that you play between those in the in that D&D trunk line so from Holmes, BX, Beckney, Real Cyclopedia, blah, blah, blah. Um, those, those rules are all, we all know, people love to argue how different they might be. My God, they're 98% they're the same and 2% different, okay? Right. None of the things that are different apply to a book like this. So it's mostly like something in a character class or one of the, the hit charts are all the same, the experience charts are the same, all those things are all the same. Um, so, uh, our inline stat blocks in the classic one fit any of those rule systems. And then we're also having an append two appendices in here. One is for swords and wizardry complete. So you're going to have all the monsters in swords and wizardry complete. And then you're going to have all the monsters in advanced dungeons and dragons one. -y. So um, when we say classic, the, in the main text of the book, everything's going to be like, like I could say, let's just call it BX. Cause that's the core that we use is going to be that kind of stat block, but we have, an appendix if you want to use it for AD and D or Thor's and Wizardry. So um, it, it's there for everyone. And it's and I, I know I'm sounding like, well, it sounds kind of generic. It is not generic. This book is pure 1000% classic D&D. It's not generic in any way, shape or form. It's very specific. If you pull out your copy of 
you know, Curse of Xanathon, you can use this book 1000% with it and you don't have to look anything up. That's the other thing that's important about that, by the way. Same thing with Endless Encounter Dungeons. You don't need to go running to another book uh, to look stuff up. Everything's in here. When I say we monster stat stuff out, you've got full stat blocks, including their special abilities, exactly what they do. You don't have to go running to a monster manual or anything else to look something up. Um, again, make the life e make life easier for a GM, not harder. So right. um, that's what it's all about. I'm trying to, I actually do have the chats on here so I can kind of look to see if anyone's asking a question about it. Um, well, I'll definitely but, be purchasing you know, this like, because I, I, anything that has random charts, I love because especially when they're set up well, like they are in the books you have. So, uh, and like I said, we, I think Endless Encounters Dungeons is, is one of the, it, man, it's just one of the best products we've ever done. We learned from the two, right. And, and we innovate a little bit with this newer one to make it even easier and faster. Um, and there's just, there's tons of charts, Mike. There's charts for literally everything you're gonna need for wilderness adventuring. The one thing I wanna make sure I, people understand, this is not a wilderness survival guidebook. If you're looking for all the rules on how to, you know, camping and all this other kind of crap, we might do a, a page or two in an appendix about that, but it is not that. This is an encounter generator or uh, multiple encounters building a whole adventure generator is what this book is it's it's that's 99 percent what this thing does and like i said then you have all the other stuff like the new monsters magic items uh, sample encounters there's maps there's all kinds of maps in here so you know if you got your pcs camped out somewhere in the woods there's a campsite map in here that you can use um if you don't have one handy so um you know again it's it's kind of a lot of stuff under one roof but all based around pretty much forest woods maybe jungle but we're going to do probably a specific jungle book later we got like four more in this series in the in the pipeline right now four oh, that's more that's great yeah, yeah we're going to do uh we got a mount we got a caves and caverns one which will probably be next um a uh seas like ocean under underwater venturing one we're going to do and then uh mountains and hills kind of and then most likely a jungle one because junk believe me there is so there's just way too much to do like we really were thinking of doing forests and jungles in one book the thing would have been 400 pages long so mm. we're like now we got to split this apart it's just it's there's too much yeah i can see that wow hmm. and like i said it's 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 been great it, the ellison Connors dungeons was the, like it's the biggest kickstarter we've ever done um and then it is at conventions we sell we either sell out of them or we you know come close to selling out every single convention we go to um it is still an incredibly big seller for us once people kind of figure out what it is you know and get a chance to look at it it uh they fly off the table i mean this year at page i think we brought we bought 60 or 75 e versions and 30 or 40 bx versions we sold out of all of them by saturday morning Wow. both books they just were gone that's and, pretty uh, and that's, that's a brand new con so it's and that's not, a brand new con so that was a big deal for us a lot of people there we've never didn't ex haven't experienced us like as much as we like to, you know we've been around for 16 years but there's still a lot of people have no clue who we are right i mean it's just how it is so um but yeah it uh it did really well so we know the forest one you know it's going to be uh, it, it's going to do just fine just fine um and i'm telling you if you if you if you're looking for anything like this this is the book for you there's not many not many products out there like there's a lot of books that have got lots of charts or you know random tables in it this is a lot of tables but you know they're, they're random obviously but they're also they're they're designed to work with each other i guess right. if it makes sense um you know, it, it it's designed to inspire you. You know, we you can either just roll it out and everything is the way it is with the dice roll, or you can make a couple of dice rolls and all of a sudden that spark hits you and you're like, oh wait, I got an idea what to do, where I'm going to go with this, and and bingo, bango, there you go. So, um, and Ben actually had a great idea when we were just getting ready to launch this. He's like, we never thought about saying this. You know, have your players roll the dice. Sometimes that's a lot of fun, right? It's like. Oh, there's going to be a wilderness encounter. You roll this dice, you roll that dice, and then they don't know what's mm -hmm. going on right behind this, you know, behind your screen with the book. But um, mm -hmm. 
that's kind of fun. And you can use this, by the way, there's a chapter on solo adventuring. So if you just, you could just roll up a solo dungeon as you go and use this book for that purpose also. Uh, as you guys know, we do a lot of solo adventures. So we yep. some, we've baked some of that in here. Um, but, it, you know, it's all about, you know, as a DM, you want to have some fun too, right? We're, we have so much work to do to run an adventure. It's, I think, nice to have a product like this where it takes a lot of the load off and you can have some fun with it because you will have fun rolling on charts. Everybody loves rolling on random charts, right? I mean, that's just, that's mm -hmm. part of it. It's intrinsic to the game. I would hope so. <clears throat> that was part of uh, the DMG in, in 1E. Yeah. In yeah. And we all rolled on those charts in the back of the DMG. This is kind of inspired by that, but I, I'm, there's a lot more to this and a lot, this makes a lot more sense. You're not going to get as, the crazy swings, you know? So, um, I think I think that's about all I can really say on it. I mean, we've just started. We're only on day two. Uh, it's a thirty-day campaign, so you got you got time. You know, I, obviously, we'd love for you to back sooner rather than later. But uh, how long is the early bird good for? I think forty-eight hours. I want to okay. say it's, it might be at the top somewhere. Oh, we'll go. Yeah, go all the way up, Eric. Uh, game yeah, for right, first right, twenty-eight right. hours. Yeah. Okay. And you know, I think all that is is an extra map or something like that. It's, yeah. It's a huge early bird thing, um, but it's it's you know it's nice to have it. And um, if you missed out on, you know, if you want a copy of Alice Encounters Dungeons, you, there's an option here. You can get a discount. You know, if you get both books, you get a mm -hmm. you get a. Uh, a nice discount on it. Okay. Well, um, that's it for you. We're through. Yeah, that's uh, it. But I'm bummed. I've, I've said my I've said my piece. Folks, there's a link in the bottom of the screen, by the way, 10 cars dash tavern dot games slash wild. It will take you to the wilderness encounters uh back of kit page. Yes. So yeah, and don't be don't be put off by backer kit. Like I said, I, I know one of the worst things you can do to your customers is make them go through an extra step, right? I mean, that's all stores are people who sell stuff. The last thing you want to do is make make someone who's going to buy your product have to do anything extra. We you know we don't want to make you do that, but don't look backer kit's easy. You can log in and create an account in a minute or two, mm -hmm. yeah. um, get through it. And I, I'm going to tell you, you're going to be impressed with backer kit is down the road and there are more people goodman games is using it now i think i don't even know if they're i don't think they're using it exclusively but they've just ran a couple or one or two now very large projects through back get monty cook ran a huge project through there uh there's been a shadow dark book has gone through uh -huh. back to crowdfunding so more people are going to use it down the road and um i think like i said i think uh i think you see more people using it for a crowdfunding source as time goes on too but as everything else, there's a learning curve, right? So. Oh yeah, but now in theory, though, it should. Uh, I would I would assume it leaves more money to the project creators, because it's it's one less level of the pie that has to get sliced off. You're not. You're yeah, not I don't know. Kickstarter and then back a kit and. Yeah, there's still I, I you know I, I'm not sure I exactly what the financial cut is from them i don't think it's as steep as kickstarter again because mm -hmm. we're going to we're going to reuse them for both functions so we probably get right probably better off there which is great i think someone's on here asking for samples i think there's some examples if you go on the kickstarter and you scroll down there might be some example mm -hmm. pages we will have um again if you back this we've got updates coming and you're going to start seeing uh as the as the uh project moves through the, the 30 days you're going to see us start posting samples and that kind of stuff of, of okay. paint and monsters and all those kinds of things. And by the way, this isn't something that's not done. This thing is done. The book's written. Um, we've just, again, we've got a few stretch goals, which mostly are art or adding a couple sample encounters. Um, they're actually pretty much done too. We're just waiting for it to fill out to see where it's at. And then it's going off to the editor. So um, we are, we're, we're down that road. This again, wasn't something that we tend not to launch and not be, not I mean, our manuscripts. You guys, are, you guys, you guys are pretty much finito when you guys launch this point. Yeah, we're pretty close. I mean, our last one, uh, uh, Toma Quest, that we delivered last 
fall, whatever. And then we delivered that one four months early. And we didn't have some crazy, like, 18-month lead time on that. I mean, we were, whatever, we had eight or nine months to, that you know, deliver deliverable on that after the Kickstarter. And we get we got it out to people four months early. So we've done that with our last two or three Kickstarters. We, we're we going to give ourselves some flex time By because way, like, we all dealt with COVID and what that did to us. Right. And even after effects, oh boy. printers are still having problems. So we got to give ourselves some, you know, leeway because, you know, we don't want to be that guy. So. I, um, you want to take a trip down memory lane? So I I'm, always I'm do. Cleaning, I'm, I'm cleaning out stuff today because I'm looking for extras and doubles and triples and what can I sell and look what I came across. Dude, is that a uh, first, that a first print, print, brother? It is a first print, and yeah. I currently have more than one. So this this may see an auction in the next year because that was your first product, I believe. Uh, one hundred copies. Uh, that was it. They're numbered on the inside. Uh, it was our really first good. product ever. Yep. I can see them. Look on the number, inside. Number front. number number twenty five of a hundred. It says there it is. Yeah, that's yep. definitely first print. It's gonna be a and, separate book and cover. Yeah. All that classic wow. stuff we did way back in the day. Yeah. I've got I've got to. So I remember this came out. I was so impressed. Um, it is still one of my favorite third party publications. It was just such a good uh, adventure, and just it was just it's perfect for B. Obviously, it's written for BX. It's perfect for BX. Yes, but, yeah. that's a BX product. Yeah. Okay, um, this too. I've got a couple. Of well, things now things. that okay, so having the one of one hundred is awesome for the first print thing in the valley. We never reprinted that, Mike. There's is this what that's we it? Because I, I know you have a few titles that were never printed. This is eighteen of a hundred. So yes. Th and that is a be, this may nobody has that book. Wow. <laughs> That's a hard one well, to find. I saw you posted recently about some of the books that never got reprinted, and I, yes. I'm kicking myself because I have I had a few of those, and I I think I got rid of them. And um, yeah, I wish I had some of the some more of those. Well, I never. I, I'm gonna tell you right now, our archive's not complete. We're missing. I'm missing all kinds of books. Um, wow, that it's killing me. And I, I watch Noble Knight. If one comes up, I don't care what they're charging. I'm gonna buy it because. I want well, one back because we don't have I, it. I, I put up a, a throne of Balir um, on eBay oh, yeah. yesterday. Yeah. I think I may have priced it too low, Bill. It sold in like five minutes. And I was like, hmm, yeah, I might want to put a put some, put some more money on the, if I had it's, if I uh, another one of those. That's that's a tough one too, right? That was a center stage miniature. The center stage miniature version. There's two yeah. cops, two versions of it, center stage and we did one, but they're both really hard to come by. Yeah. yeah. Um, I hadn't seen one in years. I I, I had no, no clue. People hang I, on to them, and yeah, yeah. I, think you know, I, stuck I, a, I stuck a hundred bucks on it, and it was gone in like five minutes. And I was like, "Well, it's uh, I guess I'll yeah. put more than that next time if I ever find another one." But that, that, that I was going to say the reason I brought that up is it's really interesting because you know you and I both we met because you were part of the cam. We like to collect. Yeah. We, you know, we 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 talked over the years even before you went to North Texas. It must be really interesting. Now you're putting out basically you're creating your own collectibles because, like you said, you don't even have some of the early stuff. I mean, you don't even have some copies no. of some of the stuff you got. Well, no, like uh, 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 V1 Vampire's Curse, which was our fourth I remember that fifth one. Yeah. module. I don't have a first print of one of those. Um, and I never, I have watched for one for ten years, and I've never seen one come up. And is that is that the one uh, with the Stefan Pogue cover? That's the Stefan Pogue cover, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and throughout, I, he did art, he did see, art through the whole book. I think I have one copy somewhere. I need yeah, to don't let it. It, don't let go of it. You just well, don't ever. So, so I think you knew this when. So when you were publishing, Doug was a huge, huge pace setter backer. And he used to yes. get like five, five or six copies of everything you did. Well, he would give me like two copies, so he would keep three, and he would give me two. So I, I have two copies of pretty much everything you did up to about 2014, 2012. Mm -hmm. And so, and and then Doug, we, we, and these, which is now with the North Tech, which belongs to North Texas, we have like three copies of pretty much everything you did. So. One of these points, we'll we'll pop those out and start auctioning those to help North Texas because that all belongs to North for Texas. For sure, now. they uh, for whatever reason, there's a lot of people who want to buy and collect those those old sure. products. Why not? And because it's amazing how I mean, we're talking 
Thing in the Valley came out over 15 years ago now. So 20, I look 2010. So you yep. you were among the first companies releasing something yeah. for the, for OSR, which you know I guess starts about 20, 2007, 2008, right in there with Osric there's a, and, there's, and two, yeah, there's like two or three guys who started like like well before me, like two or three years. Mm-hmm. You know the. Uh, 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 I, I, I honestly, I, I like to, I like to put it right about Ostrich. I, I think Ostrich is the yeah, yeah, yeah. Ostrich Labyrinth Lord Swords of Wizardry, right? And that that area to me, that's the beginning, and that's about two thousand eight, because that's about a year before North Texas. So two thousand seven, yeah, we I formed right Pace, yeah, we formed. At, okay, that's yeah, I formed Pace Center in two thousand nine, so when the company was actually formed, mm-hmm. and then uh, right. Thing in the Valley came out shortly thereafter. Um, yep. But yeah, it's and uh, you know. We've been fortunate, no. and I'm, I'm real happy with with the way things have gone. And um, we got a lot of people out there who uh, who support us, and we're, we can't, couldn't be happier about that. So yeah, you got a lot of and and I think it's cool to look at. Uh, I always tell Ben Burns, you know, I have some of his earliest projects, and it's so they're so primitive and they're so not oh, commercial. Oh, yeah. and, and, the, and now his stuff looks beautiful. And I, I think yeah. the same thing with you. Now yours is a little more professional than Pitt's work because you would hire actual real human artists um, yeah. to do art. So, cause you had some good art. Uh, I remember uh, Nada or Naga. Uh, was it, uh, Nathan was Nada, good, who did our first yeah. four books. Good stuff. And, um, absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Stuff. And I so mean, I, you guys would have some good art in there, but, but, but saying that even your, your newest stuff is even more professional. It looks I mean, yeah. your evolution in the last 15 years has been incredible we have some really good people that are working for us it's a great when i say team we have a great team you really do we, i mean we, our artists are fanta- fantastic uh keelan halverson who does all our maps is a genius he, he you know right. and, and um, I, I think you know i, I, I don't really show and tell too oh, there, there you, go. you go okay yeah there we it's are one of our, it just that was They're a new week up. Yeah, we just suck pulled, we threw that out just there, recently, actually. Yes, that, that's Mr. Suck Up below me there. Is he, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, but no, that's Lloyd. Yeah, that's Lloyd but, Metcalf cover right there. Yeah, I'm glad oh, he's finally okay. getting back to drawing stuff because Lloyd yeah. has been doing the the food wagon for a while, and he hasn't done a lot of artwork lately. So, <laughs> the yeah. dragon wagon. The dragon wagon. But I, I was going to say, I was going to compare. So I was going to say about that is, if you notice, all the companies now that were around back then, including like, I guess, Necromancer games, Frog God games. Yeah. Um, the, the level of, of professionalism now with like you and Ben Burns and Frog God games and Jeff Tulane and all these guys, it has increased like tenfold from when you guys first started out in 2009, 2010 to now. Um, you guys have really learned a lot of lessons working in the industry. And I just, I just think it's amazing to look at the, the, the quality of product now. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's for, for me, you know, I'll, I'll just, you know, speaking for me, obviously it's, um, when, when I first formed Pacer games, the, the one thing it's, you know, we kind of, like I said, our creed was we're going to innovate and we're going to, um, make life easier for the DM. I mean, that, that's our mission. Whenever we do any product, I know it sounds cheesy, but mm-hmm. that's, that goes into our team discussion. It goes out to everyone. It's like, you know, Paysetter is all about um, innovation. We did it with solo adventures. We pretty much, you know, I, we pretty much single-handedly brought those back into the world of gaming. They did not exist until we started doing them mm-hmm. around 2012, I think it was. Um, nobody was doing them anymore. What, why? Well, they're hard as hell to do, to be honest with you. Um, but, you know, we we did Map As You Go for solo adventures. No one had mm-hmm. ever done that before. TSR had some weird, you know, use a fucking magic marker or whatever to, to highlight or a red lens viewer, you know, none of these things work well. I, I don't um, think there are, that was not a high point of TSR's innovation. No, really. no. It, you know, magic, I, magic marker. look, give them credit for trying hundred percent, but it just, just didn't work. So, you know, like I said, we came up with map as you go as you, for your soul adventure. So you never get lost. You don't, you know, lose your page and go, Oh my God, I don't remember where I was at. You know, you have a map that tells you where you're at. So, um, you know, just it's always been kind of part of what we do here at Pay Center, mm-hmm. and, um, and, and look, and, and I, I don't, you know, I don't think everything you've done has been a smash success. But what's great about you guys oh, is no. you put stuff out like, up oh, that didn't work, and you just move on to the next thing. You don't sit there and you're like, we're going to put out six more just like this because Failed, nobody you liked like, this one. Yeah, you learn more. You, you, you know, I, at at my age, you know, it, the the mm-hmm. adage that you learn more by failing than you do succeeding is absolutely true. We have plenty of products that they, you know, 
I'm not saying they weren't our best effort at the time. They were our best effort at the time, mm -hmm. but it just didn't work or it just wasn't what, Oh, yeah. you know, it wasn't what we want to say. You know, we look back at it and say, you know what, that we just missed the boat on that. We could have done something X, Y, and Z different. It would have been a lot better. And that's why, well, that, you know, I, I mentioned most of the sponsors never got reprinted because, yeah. you know, we got done with them. They got out and we're just like, you know what, this could be better, but I'm not going to, you know, yeah. right now we've got so much else going on for me to go back and reinvest time, money, and effort into making that product the way I think I would make it today versus how I made it 10 years ago. You know, that's a, that's a difficult thing to do. Yeah. Bill, just well, saying, yeah, you got, I, I mean, don't know, Bill, Bill Texas knows, that we don't do. Mike and I are being <laughs> harassed right, right now by Jim Kitchen. I saw Jim Kitchen was, was yeah. Oh, I, uh -huh. he's harassing yeah. all of us. Okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah, seeing, yeah, I'm not seeing the chat or whatever, but yeah. I'm seeing, I'm getting a Facebook thing that keeps pinging up. For, for, yes. For yes. yes. And, and by the way, he's holding us hostage because he wants to be invited on. Well, invite him on. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, I'm 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 just putting the cards on the table. Every I, day, right? I mean, if, if you if he's up to bash Watsy, oh wait, are we gonna bash Watsy today? We better not, Eric. You might get in trouble. We don't want you getting. I don't know. I did a pretty good job of it last week for you, Mike. I took over and I, I think saw. I, I got thank you, brother. Yeah, I saw. I, I appreciate it. Thank you for. You're welcome for holding up the phone. Oh, well, someone's asking about Gamma X down there, aren't they? Oh, yeah. Tell us about Gamma X because I was gonna ask. I wanted to ask about that last week, then I realized it's. It was, it was Scott Swiss show, but I knew so, that somebody brought up that. When, when I when I alluded to, we're gonna have a you know we, we're not abandoning Kickstarter, everyone. So don't freak out that oh my god, Paystarter went over to Backer Kit and oh my god, they're not you know whatever. No, we're not doing that. We're Kickstarter is still a big part of it, and the next most likely the next big Kickstarter project will be Gamma X for us, and we're probably okay. looking at we were trying to get it out before Texas, but we have so much going on. It's gonna be after Texas, so it'll be this summer sometime. And I know we've been uh, telling people for a while, it's like, it's coming, it's coming. It's it, it's coming. It's just a big, big project. But Gamma X is coming. That one will go on Kickstarter for sure. Um, and we, we're play testing. You're not really play testing. We're running an adventure for it at North Texas. I think I'm doing Saturday night. I'm, I'm running okay. a game. But uh, Gamma X will be out this summer, and it'll be kickstarted, and away we go. So there's your update on Gamma X, and it's going to be nice. – it's going to be amazing. We're, we're calling it basically the eighth edition of Gamma World. So um, we're not allowed to really say that, but, and that's, you know, that's, but that's pretty much, you, you, you know, some of those, here. some of those versions weren't very good. And, I, I think very was, good. And, and I'm just going to throw this out there. I have no clue, but I bet knowing Bill Barsh and Ben Barsh that you guys have stuck very closely to first and second. It's very close to first and second. It's yeah. yes. Uh, uh, which, now, which was my the, favorite. Yeah. The the crazy thing about Gamma World though is there's so much IP involved in Gamma World that we can't use. We can't use any of the oh, proper sure. names yeah. in there, right? No. Right. So monster right. names that we can't use any of that. We're in D and D. You can use everything. You can't yeah. do that in Gant with Gant with Gamma World. Any any edition of it. So there's like I said, there's, there's an extreme amount of work that has gone into that, but it's it's going to have that early gamma world flavor that's what we're looking for the 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 world that it's set in is 500 years after the apocalypse and the apocalypse is actually was a multiple stage apocalypse um so really the the vast majority of the few people that are left on the planet the civilized people are just in little tiny towns and villages here and there and they're basically bronze age technology level people so because we wanted to make finding uh stuff from the ancients really unique really cool and a lot of fun and of course you can find a lot of it but we didn't want first level characters running around with assault rifles it just doesn't do it for me that's not what i think right. I hear you. No. oh dear god there he is he, he hey, oh oh but we got we, we got bonus Whoa, oh what shit. the hell oh my god this is this, this just is, went south in a hurry this, well, this, this is, is like my this time like to shine party. Not these, not these two jokers. This is my time to shine. Yeah. I mean, Gary, Gary practically runs the con, and Jim runs Gary Con, and here I am. I, I got nothing to offer anymore. I'll, I'll just sit Whatever. back and listen to you guys talk. You guys just talk about your uh, wonderful kick-ass days of doing shit, and I'll just. So I'll, I'll end up right? the game because I don't want to ignore the Gamma X guy. That's it for the update. It'll be uh, look for the Kickstarter this oh, summer. It'll okay. be awesome. Um, oh. um, but we're doing, we are doing, uh, by the way, and I don't want to turn people off with this, 
It's also going to have ascending armor class in there. I know some people might have some beef about that, but everyone uses it now. It's just the way. Look, it's also got to be a game for people that play all these games today. So, J- J- Jim, you look remarkably healthy. You must have survived. You look the how good he looks. Um, because I, I have barely survived the Black Death. I'm still suffering. You might oh, want to you, turn your microphone on. can't hear you, Jim. Can't hear you. Really? Oh, there we go. Oh, there I, go. I didn't get it. I managed to dodge the bullet, so I have no idea how. Everybody else got the Flumungus at GaryCon, and I did not. Yeah, like virtually everyone, right? It was a ton of people. So, so Bill, congratulations. Yeah. You're off to a hell of a start in the first week on the project. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think that's uh, just great, and uh, we're real happy. Yeah, like I, like I mentioned, we're just first time using backer kit crowdfunding, and we know there's going to be some hurdles with this. We're, it, it's not going to shoot off like probably one, any of our Kickstarter ones necessarily would do, but it's doing just fine. We're and so, and so, are you going to be running Gamma X at North Texas? Yeah, Saturday yes. night, Saturday night game. Okay, and uh, and uh, and Gary, will I see you in a game of 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 Gamma X? Uh, on Saturday he has night, no it time. Will be hard. He has no yeah. time to do that. Do not try to entice my partner to running or playing games. Ah. He, he he's gonna have his he's gonna have his hands full with bottle tech, as we call it, yep. on Friday night. Um, uh, and after bottle I'm tech, sure my, anything, I'm gonna need a splint for my liver. <laughs> yeah. Well, so well, so long as we don't get killed by, um, you know, the guy who attempted murder last year, Chris uh, Stogdale. With his uh, crazy oh, whiskey, whiskey. I've got this. German I've got this great yeah. idea. Yeah, I've got whiskey from a us, country you've never heard of. No, he's <laughs> promised us that 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 pretend it never happened is what his he's told. I'm us. pretty. I'm pretty sure three of us on this table right here were praying to the porcelain god after at some point I, after that. I, I didn't get I was sick. That close. I felt terrible, but I didn't I, get sick. I had no idea that there were that many different flavors of regret that could be bought. Yeah, one hundred percent. Oh. I look forward to the pickle beer. Okay, let's just. <laughs> oh, 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 my oh Lord. I But Jim, to oh, answer your question, yeah, I, I, I allow I, myself to do Friday night Baltech because I can fit it in. It's on a day that's not too busy. But Wednesdays and Thursdays are usually not good, and Saturday in the evening is definitely not good because we're prepping for the the auction. So, 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 Bill, are you going to do a pre-release Gamma X module for North Texas? Uh. If I say yes, my son is probably going to shoot me in the head. He already told he's me he's not here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on. Commit, Bill. Commit. I think a nice air. digest. Yeah, size I don't see, I don't see been anywhere. The answer: here. If we do one, it's going to be one of those like lay flat, spiral bound kind of deals. It's not going to be. It's not going to go through all of our. Who cares? Awesome. You know, like, That's those, right. like our tournament modules that we do. Like you know, here's our tournament version. It would be something like that. It's not going to be a full blown. No, no, we can't. We don't, I don't have time. We've got, we've got, we didn't even talk about all the home shit we're doing, which is insane, by the way. Well, talk um, about it. This is what this is for, bud. It, well, if you want homes, we've got the Islands of Peril, which is going to be released at North Texas, and it's probably going to be two or three books hardcover um, of all homes goodness. It's like basically all oh. island adventures that they sent us all these maps. Oh. And, it's oh, it's insane. I gotta, t- I gotta take a minute. I gotta take a minute. Hold on, you guys. Oh, keep well, we're not done oh, because we're oh, also doing. Oh god, he's got three vendor tables. Oh, so he's got yeah. He's oh god. Oh god, and we're gonna we're have doing... a tubing episode here with Bill <laughs> oh. or with Mike. Oh god, Mark, Mike's I... having a good time with the homes, and then oh, we're oh, doing. Oh. Uh, All right, uh, Return of the Dark better. Towers, the tournament this year. Yeah, uh, and and that's you know basically an homage to Janelle and. Uh, we wanted to do something for her with the passing and all the rest of that. So, so, um, so that's going to be out also. So for me to commit to a, yet another book, I oh my god. But but Bill, I've got a okay. So I would do like a sixteen-page, short and sweet something or other, right? You know, when you look at when you look at Legion yeah. of Gold or you look at, at Famine and Fargo, these are very thin modules. You know, they really well, really are pretty thin modules. Yeah, my but, my thought. Go ahead, Jim. But the real question, I, I, I mean, one of the things that I've never heard you talk about, you know, you're working with all the homes material from the estate. Yeah. And the thing that I would really like to know is what have you found where you've just had a holy crap moment or, or been surprised by or stunned by what what has really sort of taken the two of you back when you found it or, or been going through things? Um, it's hard to say, really. I mean, 
the interesting thing about getting all that stuff from him is how little like he was definitely i think one of those minimalist dms yep. where he 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 would draw his map he would write down a couple notes in pencil and then he would probably do most of it on the fly at the table uh because mm. there's not a lot of detail in any of the stuff we get from him specifically but he's also all over the place i mean he's got amazonians he's got weird lovecraftian creatures i mean he clearly draws his inspiration um from all kinds of different sources like you you can really tell what inspired him dnd wise but it's also a really cool look at i mean this stuff was probably written i would say most of it in 75 and 76 i don't and, and I think that that really reflects the time period, he, right? It yes. was much more a skeleton and you hang things off of it as you're going along and you roll the dice and you have the random encounters and, and you yeah, sort of for give sure. and take with the party. I think. It, yeah. And, you know, if you've, ever read, uh, if you've ever read Maze Apparel, Maze Apparel is, if you look at Maze Apparel, that is a snapshot of what D&D &D was like. In about For 75, sure. 76, 77, it's, it's amazing because it, it's like you said, Bill, it's all over the place. It's got lizard men and sorcerers and sci-fi and turtles with rake. I mean, it's got anything you can imagine because that's what you did back then, right? You just threw everything in the kitchen sink in your D&D &D game. Right. So, yes, for sure. And actually, with, with when we did the um, Things Better Left Alone, which is his maze apparel dungeon that we did last year, uh, that's going to we're bringing that back this year in hardcover form um, to go along with all this other stuff we have. Um, there was a little bit more detail to those maps and those descriptions. The stuff we have now, I've got more. I've got at least a dozen, 14 maps and pages of notes for I, for the isle, all the various islands that we're doing, which is forms of island campaign. So basically we're setting up a mini campaign where the best we can think that works with, you know, all the home stuff. Um, and put, doing it in a cohesive manner. So it all, at the end, when we're done with all this home stuff, it'll all fit together. So sure. um, things better and left. Please home. God tell me the spines will all match, right? Don't, don't do this where four out of the five are identical. And then the no, fifth is like, that, and we hired somebody new. Yeah, no, they, they will. That's why we're doing the things better left on hardcover this year with these. So the, the books will all be the same um, um, as far as that goes. But it's crazy. It's a lot of fun, but it's also it's challenging because you get like he has uh, one of the first things, you know, first ones I actually did was he's got a place called Cyclops Island. That's it. There's no detail. There's no anything. And you're like, OK, I I'm not going to just write up. I'm not just going to write up an island with a Cyclops on it. You know, I it mean, Cyclops on it. Well, as much as oh, I know, spoiler alert, as much as you want to do that, you know, it's like, well, but we're writing a book and we're going to sell it to people and, and all the rest of that. So it's, um, so that got kind of changed to the Island of the crying Cyclops and the crying Cyclops is actually this massive mountain with a hole at the top. <laughs> and there's a river that flows out of this hole and all that. And So, so, so let me ask a different question, Bill. When, when yeah. you've got all the published things, Right when you're through publishing everything, yes. Do you think there's enough of the original material, source material, that you could do, sort of a here's how we got it, here's here's pictures of things. I mean, I, one of the most interesting things to me that I've ever owned are um, Arkham House's selected letters of H.P. Lovecraft. Like you really get an interesting look into the mind of Lovecraft through all of these letters that he wrote, and. And one of the things that I really admire by some place that might rhyme with Goodman Games is that is that volume one of Judges Guild and, and particularly volume two gave you access to raw documents, right? Now, most of the raw documents are all in Meinhardt's collection. But, but really and truly what I would like to see, we don't get a chance, most of us never get a chance to actually see the original documents, like see right. the hand-drawn maps and so on. And so, so even, I, I'm not saying it, I'm not saying that there is enough of an audience to do a hardcover. I would do it on a pre-order basis, but I would absolutely be committed to buying something that has copies of the maps, you know, really has all these hand-drawn notes and everything else. So they're going to be in the books. Gonna... I, I don't want to cut you off. They're going to be in there. So Excellent. we're going to, we're going to include all the original stuff in these books. We did that. If you go to the, in, not everyone might realize this, but if you go to the, all the way to the back of things better left alone, Yep. Those all his original maps and notes, they're in the very back of the book. We included them. We want my God, people, you are the hero say, we don't deserve. 
where did where did Bill get this stuff from? Well, here's where I got it from. And you know, it's this doesn't belong to me. It doesn't necessarily belong to anyone. It belongs to all of us. That I mean, to me, Holmes had that kind of impact on Dungeons and Dragons. He yeah. does not get the credit on it. I mean, I we think, all talk about the home set and all the rest of it, but yeah, I got I got four copies yeah, of the home set the right, right, right there. there. Those aren't but, the good ones, right? I mean, and and he certainly didn't get the credit or payment from TSR, who just didn't do anything for the poor guy. Um, so. Um, They'll all be all, all, all the original stuff that I have from the Holmes estate will be in these books. They'll they'll be in the like an appendices, and you can see exactly what we used to generate these. Uh, you know, I think going to be wonderful adventures. So, yeah, <clears throat> we really don't deserve you. We really don't. Like you guys have come so far, and and you're just the best. well. I I take it as you know, if you would ask, like I, I say this all the time, if you would ask 15 year old Bill. Uh, in 1979, who should, you know had these had the Holmes box set and all the rest of it, if I ever would have got a chance to touch the same things that these guys created, I would have laughed in your face, right? I mean, but I, I don't know if we should really talk about you wanting to touch things, Bill. I yeah, think well, just, when you're 15, when you're 15, okay. let's just you know it is what it is. Um, <laughs> You, you know you know where I'm going here. I mean, we. And, and, uh, I'm afraid of where 15 year old Ben touching well, things is, go, or hey, Bill hey, is going. Hey, you. <laughs> but but, but you, so, it ties in where we were talking about earlier, Bill, is that yes. the the things that we did back, you know, 2007, 8, 9, and yeah. now you look at what we do now, it's so much more professional and it looks as good or personally, and I get on this kick a lot. I think it looks better than a lot of the stuff that came out in oh, 1979 so through 1980. I mean, it really is. I mean, I, and, and my, my long said thing that I still believe in is you take five creators right now, you know, take Jeff Tulanian, Bill Barsh, Greg Gillespie, you know, pick the other two, put them back in time to 1980 and they would basically dominate the gaming well, industry. I, I, that, that's how good the stuff is. Up my, now, and, I'm cleaning up my up. office right now. And I've been, I've been yeah. actually going through and trying to sort stuff and get st some stuff boxed up after two years of neglect. And one of the things that I've been struck by is, um, so, so Bill, what do you use for your publishing software? You, do you use InDesign? Um, you have to ask our designer, which is Susie Mosby, but I believe she uses InDesign. Sure, um, and and that's become the that's the industry our, standard. Yeah, we use for like, like if you get one of the like, I still do like our tournament adventures. I'll still I'll still do all I'll do all that work on those. So those right. are coming out of Microsoft Publisher actually, which sure. isn't great, but it, it works for my purposes there. But Susie, I'm almost positive uses InDesign. Well, so, I, I, so I like this, looking, yeah, yeah. When I keep bringing up Endless Encounters, this massive hardcover, this is this was done through InDesign. And Mike, so, I think you're right. I would put this book up against anything that comes out of uh, our friends, our pointy hat friends on the West Coast. Any day of the week, I'd put this book up against anything they produce. Well, and and I think particularly, I, I was literally <laughs> going through a box of of books that all came from about 1995, 1998, and and my God, they all look like they've just been stamped out of the same thing. And I think that's mm -hmm. one of the reasons why why fifth edition it started off fresh. But my God, every book looks like every other book. They do. Every book looks like every other book. And yeah. the art style, you know, Pathfinder has the same problem. And and they don't go for clean. They go for you know they're printing in such high volumes they can afford to do color in a way that most publishers can't. But it also excuses, frankly, atrocious layout. And and really just this sort of muddled, muted. There's nothing vibrant. There's nothing exciting about it. And 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 again, well, Jim, I think that's where you win the knife fight in a phone booth. Hands well, Jim, down. Jim, you, you, and a lot of people here are comic book fans. Do you remember when we knew comics were going down the toilet? It was about the mid '90s when they had yeah, all black the and white, the black and white covers. crash. Yep. Or the special, yeah, they have those special covers. This one has a prism, and this does this, and then whatever. And and the soon as Watsy started doing that, I was like. When they start doing the special covers that, to me, are just as available as the non-special covers, I knew that there was they're not relying on the quality of their product anymore. They're relying on these tchotchkes to try to it's get gimmicks. Push well, it's it's gimmicks. It's absolutely yeah. gimmicks, and that's. I have a comment on that too, which I you know me, I have a comment on everything. Um, <laughs> that I, I didn't have any Harper, and that they necessarily did that because part of the reason they were doing that was those were going to hobby shops and game stores. 
as kind of like game store exclusives. And it, that was helping those stores out, right? Because that brought people right. in and right. it, it, it was it was great. And then Wizard said, well, wait a minute. There's a real marketplace for this? Of course, they yeah. pulled that, effed over all those hobby stores. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, and now we're all just pissed about it. Now you buy them all on Amazon. Now you get them on Amazon. If you want right. them, go That's to Amazon. Nobody cares you about them on Amazon. Yeah, you're not going into your local store anymore. If if Mike's gonna have his cat, I'm gonna get one of my two Bolotomine. So, so <laughs> I, I remember that right, and and I remember the hardest part about that was that that you know Dragon Two Hundred has the the holograph in the yeah. middle of it, right? And and that was their printer saying, "Hey, we can do this magical thing, and it'll make it even more special." <laughs> and and it didn't. It didn't make mm-hmm. the issue any better yeah. than than anything else. It just made it more expensive to publish. Right. Um, yeah. And all of the comic book publishers got burned by this. All the Ashcan editions from the mid '90s. This is oh, why yeah. the black and white craze yeah. crashed in in the early '90s. Um, yep. We're sort of seeing that again, but it's the only way. You know, pom- comic book publishers have to do these limited runs to just try to drive sales. But when you look at overall figures in the industry, comic book sales have cratered, absolutely cratered. The number one leader yeah. is Marvel, but but even then, they're not. I think the last figures I saw, they are anywhere from, they're at 20 to 30% of what sales were 25 years ago. And and that's because we've moved away from it in such a long way. And there's so much available backstock online. If I see a comic book I'm interested in, I no longer buy it. I actually go poke around on the internet to try to read a few issues before I buy it. And that saved me from buying a lot of atrocious comic books. Um, I I really hey, think, I, 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 I think, think we're you. right. Sorry. Well, I was just say what the, what they will tell you is well you know people aren't reading as much anymore that's why we're not selling as much that is a lie so, if you look at manga sales and anime sales manga sells outsells anything the United States puts out so people are still reading comic books they're just not reading crappy comic books so so let me talk to let me talk to a point Mr. Guns just raised a couple of points and and I'll say this one of the smartest people in the in the independent publishing tier is Jim Wampler and I say that because Jim Wampler gets it. Mm-hmm. Where a lot of third-party publishers don't understand this. You have to have a great-looking, dynamic cover for your first book, whatever it is. If your first book is a muddled, steaming pile of dung from the outside, it doesn't matter how good it is on the outside. You're selling your first thing to get their attention. It has to be beautiful. It It just has to be spectacular. Because the first thing you sell them, then, is what gets them to buy the second thing. Right. Content is king. You have to have a great looking you have to have great content, but you absolutely have to have something to sell it. Michael Whalen sold more books for Del Rey because he and Judy Del Rey got along really well. And Judy Del Rey recognized a young man with a lot of artistic talent and recognized that the more books she put him on the cover of as an artist, the more books she was going to sell. And this is why. You know, we can start invoking the names, right? All the Willinghams, Earl, yep. Earl Otis, all the rest of them. That art, you know, this is why I don't think, I think I have a nasty copy of the second edition player's handbook, but that's the only copy I have. And I have like 20 copies of the first edition player's handbook with the Sutherland cover. Because which one really gets you going? Which one excites you? The orange binding, the orange spine copies of the DM's guide and the player's handbook they're tepid. They're absolutely tepid artwork, and that's that's not an insult to that's not an insult to Easily or whoever it is that did the cover paintings. But they don't have the same crackle. They don't have the right. same buzz. Well, and so, he, he, Easily just called. He wants you banned from the North Texas. Is that okay, Gary? <laughs> um, so you know what I just found out was fascinating. The cover. I think it's the Dungeoneer Survival Guide. He didn't even draw that cover for that book. CSR was so screwed up and behind, they asked him, do you have anything that you've done that you haven't yes. used? And that's what they pulled for the cover of that book. So, seriously? I mean, yeah. that's, that's how they rolled. I mean, so, yeah, the, like Jim says, those covers, the, the, the orange spine covers do... Look, Easy's work is stands in a mountaintop, right? Oh, he, yeah. he doesn't want Bill. He doesn't want Bill yeah, Barsh to too. show up either. That's oh, right. We're gonna have, yeah, um, Bill Barsh is banned. Books, so just, they just don't do it. So anyway, I, I wanted to go back because you guys got me all in the Gamma X mindset. Um, yeah, it's Saturday night. Hey, Jim, you're actually signed up for it. <laughs> yes, I knew, I knew that. I know. I just scroll down there. Boy, this, so 
What a what a scam this whole this whole. But, uh, but really and truly, what, what I think I think I think we're primed, right? So 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 here I'll I'll venture into post apocalyptica for a second. So so I was a first edition, second edition Game of World guy. Like oh my god, and and I shared with some of you a picture that I had where I had filled out the TSR survey form and demanded Metamorphosis Alpha be reprinted, and they actually sent that back to me. There's a funny story of why that came back to me. But um, but third edition, eh. fourth edition, eh. let's not talk about fifth, sixth, just eh. and and the less said, the better. Right. But but what I what I thought was a cool idea for Mutant Crawl Classics. Right. And there's there's a handful of post apocalyptic games. Right. Um, as interesting as they are, none of them really capture the tone, the oh shit tone of first edition gamma world right when you read about how the world ended there's there's all sorts of gaps and there's all sorts of of there's no specific details laid out but you knew it was a holy shit moment right the planet moved the planet shook because whole things were vaporized and blah blah right. blah 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 and one of the great things of gamma world was always that weird discovery right i'm gonna roll a bunch of dice and i might blow up my hand or i might get a tentacle out of my forehead or i might have discovered a mark four fusion blaster Woo! And and I don't think I love MCC. I do. I really like it. But I'm, you know, I want something a little grimmer. I want something a little tougher. I want something a little harder edged. And and when you soften it down, and I think I I had a really interesting conversation at Gary Con about first edition D and D versus fifth edition D and D. And and fifth edition was described as you get a participation trophy. Your character's not going to die. Everything's going to be okay. We're going to hold your hands, and we've got an umbrella over you, so you're not going to get wet, and everything's safe. And the great thing about first edition D&D um, is that, oh, you could die. You very well could die. And you may even die before you get 20 feet into the dungeon, right? And and the saves are there for a reason, and sometimes you're going to blow them, and you know, a wish should be something, you know... <clears throat> In a pre-con game, we used a wish to resurrect a character. And and I'm going to mispronounce his name, and I, I apologize. Anthony Husso, H-U-S-O, who, um, whose website is The Blue Bard. Um, he's been to North Texas. I've been trading notes with him, and I've told him he really, really, really needs to come back to North Texas this year. Um, I, think, <coughs> I think his take on first edition, if you go to his website, he has a number of really interesting articles because he uses first edition ex exclusively for his D&D campaign. And he addresses a lot of what I would call those mortality moments where, you know, oh, shit, I'm dead. Ugh, I got to roll up another character. And, and I think that edge is missing. So, so with Gamma X, I hope, that, I hope that first edition edge is there, right? I, it, it is. It is for sure. Like, like I said, we're starting it out very starkly, right? Your, your character is going to be running around with a loincloth and a freaking spear. That's how you're going to start. You know, I, and, and finding stuff needs to be difficult and unique. And you're never going to walk into a town, you know, at least the campaign, how we're setting it up, how we're suggesting you run it is you're not going to walk into a town like you did. I know you brought Legion of Gold. You know, you walk into a town, Legion of Gold, and there's this mayor who's got a freaking literally an army with, of guys with freaking APCs, machine guns, mortars, you name it. They got all this shit. We're, we're not doing that. We're, we're finding you're going to find stuff because that's that's also a major part of the game. Yeah. You got to find stuff. You have but to kill gonna, monsters and get treasure. It's going to have right. to kill monsters and get treasure. Kill monsters and get treasure, but it's going to be very unique to the PCs. And we're, we, we've set it up even to the point where there's not even that many PCs and NPCs running around. The um, civilization is just barely, you know, hanging on by a, a, a fingernail and it's just starting to crawl out of the abyss. There's really few people who are, um, what, what, what the term we use is basically adventurer caliber people. So, uh, there might be a lot of mutants running around, but they're not they're not adventurer mutants, right? Sure. It's, it's people. Right? One of one of my favorite the merchant, they're the banker, they're the the blacksmith, they're those kind of guys. They're not adventurous. So even adventurers are very, very rare and uncommon. Um, and that's just kind of how we want to set this game up to kind of like you said, a little grimmer, a little darker, a little more um the unexpected. And uh because I think it makes things that much more exciting. When those PCs walk into find some you know, ancient building and they walk into it, everything should be fun and new to the character. Now we as players have got to 
you know, you've got to suspend your disbelief. You, you can't know what, you know, there's uh, a, you know what a bank card does, for example. There's right? a Neil Stevenson novel that's sort of post-apocalypse, right? So, so 2000 years in the future, um, people are revisiting earth. And one of the things they come across, they uncover is a truck axle. And, and there's a brief discussion about, you know, what is this? Well, it's attached to what's left of the, of the, of a trailer of a, of a mm -hmm. semi truck. And there's a brief little bit of, you know, wow, it's a 2000 year old piece of technology. Isn't that interesting? But at the end of the day, what are you going to do with a truck axle? Right. You know, there's yeah. really not a lot for the player. I mean, the player characters found a truck axle. That's great. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to make a cart? Cause the wheels have rotted off. Um, you know, but, but there's a really neat little moment in that. And, and then there's another one, um, Jack McDivitt's eternity road where the, the player characters, essentially the, 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 the characters in the novel are trying to find a repository of books and, and in the end, oh, they find it and they have some adventures along the way. And it's, and it's very much a first edition gamma world kind of book, right? Mm -hmm. There's no mutants, but they do find the AI that's like, kill me. I, I've been supervising a train station with nobody visiting me for hundreds of years. Kill me. I'm done. I don't want to be a part of this anymore. Just turn the power off and let me die. And and that's very powerful. But but you know, this sort of quest for lost knowledge that drives them out to go get them to go look and, and so on and so yeah. forth. It's very much a first world it's a very much a first edition Gamma World campaign. And it's sure. really, really good. Sure. And it, that's like I said, that's the that's the theme we're going for. Um, but again, that's, that's again, theme and mechanics are two different things. So it's going to be themed old school, first, second edition gamma world rule sets going to be a little more modern. Um, like I said, we're going to probably use the sending armor class in there. Um, by probably, I mean, we are, um, we are, <laughs> uh, we're going to use, uh, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll go to the man on this. I think, uh, the advantage disadvantage, um, uh, rules that came in with 5e are fantastic. Now, I'm not. We're not using them the way they do because they're crazy with it. It's constant. It's in every single situation. But I think a little bit of it is a good thing. So, um, believe me, you're, you're gonna. It's going to be evocative, one e two e, but it's also going to be a game that if you got a bunch of people who their only experience has ever been 5e, we we really want a game out there that also makes them feel comfortable and want to play a game like that instead of moving to something that's so alien to them that they're not going to enjoy it. There has, I think there needs to be a little bit of that commonality thread. You, you and, have to, you have to walk yeah, both sides of it. We got to walk both sides for sure. And, and that, that's just the way it is. So um, that that's where we're going with that, but never fear. It's any, everyone out there who knows anything about me, it's going to be as old school as old school gets. You, you know, that's what pace setter does. So that's what we Matter love about you, Bill. Is if we cut you open, old dice would fall out. They would. <laughs> Like a pinati. <coughs> Mike, Jim, um, somebody, the the bad bike asked you a question. They wanted to know if um, you're running your Sirens Battle of the Bands adventure that you've been working on secretly. Um, can you tell us anything about that? Me? <laughs> yeah, Battle um, of the Bands. Somebody, yeah, Sirens Battle of the Bands. I, I don't know I if have, it came out I'm or not. Sorry, it was Kickstarter. I'm sorry. I, I'm not that high, and I don't smoke. I have no idea what he's, what they're talking about. Okay, so do you want to know what you want to know what I'm working on? I'll tell you what I'm working on. I'll tell you what I'm yes. I'll tell you what I'm working. On. So, um, I found in my office right after two years of neglect. Oh God, don't do that. Jesus. Oh, you got to see what it is. Come on. Oh, no, after two years of neglect, um, I'm finally picking up the pieces on um, what I call Spring Haven. And so I actually did a play test with some folks a couple of years ago before the job that sucked me in. Just go back to whites. Don't don't zoom in. That's I've got a face for radio. You're killing me. So um, I really. So one of my favorite modules is the Mad Mansion of Professor Ludlow. And as terrible as the module is, you know, hey, you walk into a room, random encounter. You walk into another room. It's a random encounter. You walk into a room. It's not. It's just. Argh. But one of the things that I thought that Jim Ward had a real clever idea with was actually giving people a chance to play as kids and giving them a chance to explore and poke around and do stuff. 
And so my favorite books growing up were um, the Brindley, um, Bernard Brindley, the, um, the, the Adventures of the Mad Scientist Club, which were short stories that were- I love those. Oh my God. Yeah, they were so in good. Boy's Life. And then yes. there was a novel were... called The Big Kerplop. And then there was we're a trying... novel that went unpublished until his kids managed to get it published about 25 years ago. And so the other was I consumed all of the Alfred Hitchcock and the Three Investigators books, right? Those Cut my great. teeth on Scooby-Doo when I was a kid, blah, 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 blah. Yep. And so Springhaven is essentially um, a scout's encounter something spooky and creepy on what is a giant uh, estate from a, a, a Pacific Northwest uh, timber baron. But there are things that have happened and so on and so forth. And so you essentially have one of these Gilded Age sort of mansions and grounds that is trapped in a bubble of time due to things that have occurred. And the scouts, with the help of, of we'll call them local native guides, um, work their way into the bubble and then begin to have misadventures. And so it's got everything for... Um, What's the what's the what's the character from Saturday Night Live that used to do the reviews? It has everything, right? So it has elves, it has Japanese exploding balloons from World War II. It has this, it has that, and so I'm I'm sort of poking around on getting my notes for Springhaven, sort of thing. because at some point I'm going to want to try to publish it, but I just don't. I'm sure I could get Susie Mosby to lay it out for me. So put in the good word for me, Bill. That would be great. Talk to Ben. By the way, I just I, I, I just checked and I just checked and if you are interested in the uh, Mad Scientist Club, all the books are back in print. I just noticed, including yeah. the Big Kerplop, which I remember I had to pay like a hundred dollars for years and years ago. Oh yeah, it was, <laughs> and it was out of print. Big, now I'm finding it now fifteen bucks. So yeah, you can find all the books here. The Big Kerplop's it's the great one because that's actually the story of how the the group got together. Uh oh. Uh oh, Bill's yeah. Bill's put Bill, something up. Trying to put some up here so uh, you guys can see it. So there is a an, uh, there's an original Holmes map right there. That's uh, wow. Okay, what do we got? And now oh, here we go, Cyclops Isle. Hole, spring. Okay. Looks like something I, I looks like I something I coughed up uh, during my uh, problem so times. Let me week. let me show you an so artifact I've had for thirty years, right? We were cleaning out my grandfather's desk when he retired, and this is graph paper from the 1930s. Oh, damn. It's, it's this stuff. It's literally the same as this stuff right here. That's crazy. Right? And I, yeah. I, I have no idea what he used it for. There's like a dozen sheets that are left, but it's, it's graph paper from leftover from his school from when he went to school bill Hader, yes stefan i'm going to be the stefan of role-playing games if i'm not um, already the stefan yes probably accounting right didn't they use that paper mostly for accounting purposes i don't know right but but stupid jim you know 10 12 year old jim 12 year old jim used a bunch of it to make some adventures which are not worth showing anybody ever oh <laughs> <laughs> Ugh. Although I did have a moat house, I did a I didn't do a moat house. I actually did a um, I did a castle on an island in the middle of a river where they had fortified it, and they essentially were brigands forcing boat traffic to pay to pay fees until the the local regent got tired of it and nuked the castle. And the adventurers are hired to go take a look and poke around and and see what's still in there. And so I, I use those, I use sheets of that for all of that. So somewhere, uh, third or fourth shelf. Anyway. Sounds like fun to me. They put big chains across the river. And they wouldn't let you go by unless you paid. <laughs> oh. so, I'm not clever. Some bitches. I'm not clever. Where'd Gary go? Wait, I, I know where Gary went. Hold on. Uh, He's, he's on Cyclops he's Island. Cyclops Island. He's got things to do. He's he's a busy man. Don't bother him. Let him get done. All right. Well, I'm going to get out of here. I horned in. I should leave. Don't it's him. good to see y'all. Jim was nice Texas only a couple months away. What is it? We're less than two weeks away from registration for the rest of the events for event right. registration, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. All right, Gary. Right, Gary's, Gary's going to have that done tonight, aren't you, Gary? Yeah, uh, he already he got it done an hour ago. He just told me. No, just... He's the best. Hope. All right, you guys congratulations have a great to Jack. Too. I know we posted on Facebook, but that's, yes. that's awesome. Yes. We yes. can't discuss yes, what great. he. I'm triple secret pro game. The worst part is right. Mm -hmm. I can't tell people what my son has achieved. I can't tell him the job he has. I'm I'm triple secret probation to keep it quiet, right? And I'm like, oh my god, I want to tell everybody. He's like, you can't tell anybody. I'm like, okay. And he's like, I told my girlfriend she can't even tell her parents. And I'm like, seriously? Mm. What the hey? So anyway, triple secret probation. Have a good one, guys. Talk to you later. We'll talk soon. Love you, love you, Jim. See you later, buddy. Jim Kitchen will be at our convention. He will be running the auction again, as he has done for the last three years. We really appreciate his help. Awesome guy. Uh, yeah, Gary, awesome. I think we'll be at our con. I'm not sure. I don't know where he's at. Right? He he may or may not be helping us out. He may be. Probably just ran out the buckies or something. Because, oh my God, he's got so much stuff going on. This guy. So he literally has three jobs. He has his job. He has Doug's old company, which he still runs, and he has the convention. And I mean, it's just I can't believe he puts in as much time and effort as he does. But. Um, we, we couldn't do it without him. North Texas could not run without without him and without Jim. Jim helps us quite a bit with the auction. It, it's up, something I don't mind doing and I like doing, but Jim does it so much better that I stepped back a few years ago. Like, oh, I it's, want to do it. He's, you are, Jim, is a, yeah. Jim is the auction god, yeah. right? I mean, I, I helped uh, – this year I helped uh, Ron Musker at Philly – you know, the page convention. So him and I were the yeah. auctioneers for three and a half hours, it, by the way. It's hard. He it's hard, isn't it? Much, it wears yeah. you out. Yes. It wears you out. It, but Mike, he had so much stuff. It was, it, I mean, it was awesome, but he had yeah. literally milk crates just piled up. Most of, you know, a lot of it was, now look, he had a, the amount of collectible stuff he had was insane. But then he had like 12 copies of um, uh, like Battletech. Or FASA's Star Trek role playing game, right. which were all beat to hell, missing half the contents. You know, just stuff like that that we were trying to get rid of. Uh, Silent Death. I mean, just, just, I never, I mean, all kinds of old Starfleet battle stuff, which I bought, by the way. Damn, um, I could, can't help myself. But just, uh, oh my God. But, you know, I, I'm a, I'm not, I wouldn't even consider myself a novice. You know, Jim is, right. Jim is epic level. So, yeah. Amazing. Well, guys, I, I need to jump off here, but I, I want to bring up a couple of things real quick. Yeah, you need to, if I can. You need to talk about whatever you were supposed to talk about. So we are at 466 attendees, which means we are within 35 of we're going to... hit, hitting 500. Um, we are, yeah. I've had 27 new games submitted just in the last eight days. So we're going to cross 300 events, no problem. Um, so... If you don't have a ticket, get a ticket. If you don't have a shirt, get a shirt. Uh, get games submitted and get signed up because we are. It's moving. <laughs> we will. Nice. We will sell out, and when we sell out, we will sell out. We we will still sell tickets at the door. But we will not sell tickets if there's not games to be in. We, we That's correct. It. So yeah, so don't don't procrastinate, people. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you right now. It's do not um, do not. You guys you guys are gonna blow past that number. I mean, especially with event registration coming up, right? There's a lot of people to see. Yeah, so event registration is Monday the 15th at 6 p.m. Dallas time, Central Daylight Time, as I've been reminded. It's not standard time. The Central Daylight Time. So 7, so, 7 o'clock for all us real there, there you go. So, um, and, and event submissions will shut down Friday the 12th at midnight. Thank God. So that I will have time to get everything ready. Um, other than that, oh, oh uh, just uh, keep an eye, keep an eye on Facebook because I'm going to post some things. Go ahead. Clothing Go is optional for the uh, April fifteenth sign up. Clothing, clothing optional. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, that's yeah. good to know. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then I will be posting. Uh, so, I'll be posting stuff on Facebook over the next week too about um, shirts for. Uh, sponsorship shirts for the the serving winches and things like uh, 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 sponsorship or advertisement in the program so I'll start uh, really hitting that pretty heavy over the next week so just keep an eye out I try to post everything on Facebook and discord uh, so anyway 
keep your eyes open. But I've got to go take care of a couple things, but I just want to get that out there while I had the platform. All right, Gary. Talk soon. All right. Thank, Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Thanks for showing up. Hey, hey, Bob. Thank Bob Goodnow. So is he lo- is Bob Goodnow local to you guys down there, Mike, or is he not? No, he's Ma- he's Ma- he's uh, Massachusetts. Uh, Bob, Bob, Bob Good. Uh, that's Bob Good. Bob, if you, you, if you bring all that crap to Page, yeah. we'll we'll deal with it because I'll have a car there. If yes. you if you go with it, yeah, I don't know I'm if sure you're going to Page or not. Definitely. I mean, if you, if you bring it to a con, I'm driving. Hey. I'm actually driving to Texas this year again. Hey, so, um, so we we oh, it's not a bad drive, man. I make it every I make it up there. It's like a two day drive. It's not too bad. Um, I, I feel bad at this yeah, year, though because it's, I, it's I, I I drove back with guppy and i was coughing the first day and by the second day i was hacking and poor guppy is as sick as i was a week ago and he is yeah yes, we, we just have made made steve getty sick I, I feel bad about that but well it is what it is we, i mean um, like i talked about we have so much stuff going on in texas this year I'm, i need to um i'm gonna drive most of it down just because shipping it's a pain in the neck and dealing with all that so yeah, i think yeah, I'm just gonna drive it here. and then i'll probably just drive to florida that's a good afterwards idea. That, that's a great idea yeah. Yeah. Why not? I may I may go with you to Florida. Shit. I don't, I don't want to be around here. You should. It's wonderful down here. I don't, I don't, cl- I don't want to clean up. I don't. I don't want to clean up anything. I, I just want to go. I want to leave when the convention's done and walk out the door, and then I'm I'm out the yeah. door. That's it. Somebody else can clean up. Uh, Gary can clean up as well as put everything together. <laughs> you can make Gary do all the work. So so we have thirty minutes here. I I thought we could talk about one thing because. Um, yes, I thought it was funny. Apparently, apparently, Bill, you and I got hammered uh, by various people who think we're we're mean we're mean to Watsy. We're, we shouldn't be as mean to Watsy as we are. And so I and so I, you know, okay, whatever. If you love Watsy, I understand that's great. But I I watched uh, Eric's um, uh, stream the other night when he talked about the thirty percent drop in. Um, tabletop rpgs or is it was it no 30 percent drop was and is it n world got it was an n world article written by morris using icv2 uh apparently it's a pro he has a pro account i do i have one now too where you get so you get more than just their basic article you get the more in-depth <clears throat> and uh uh tabletop or uh, tabletop rpgs are down but D and D as a brand is down in hobby shops and Kickstarter, thirty uh, percent, mm-hmm. and that was twenty twenty three. You figure twenty twenty four is going to drop even further from those numbers as we get well, farther away from COVID because we had the big COVID bounce. Obviously, uh, last, COVID year, bounce, we, but... last year we had BG three, which was huge. Uh, last year we had the D and D movie, which even though it didn't make a lot of money, its influence was big. I mean, people talked about it; they never talked about D and D before. We had all these things happening. Now this year we have the 50th anniversary, which so far I haven't been wowed by a single 50th anniversary or anything. I couldn't even tell you anything really. They're doing 50th anniversary. Um, that number is going to go down. That number will will definitely go down. Hey, Kurt. I know he was on there earlier, but Kurt must still be lurking around. Um, so, well, I, there's several factors for that. One, one we're, we're, we are not, uh, I don't care what anybody says, we are not in a strong economy right now. No. And look, whether we like it or not, discretionary spending on, on our hobby is going to decrease when the economy is not great. Sure. Um, I'm just leaving it there. It's not a political statement or anything else, but our economy, it, it is. People are just down. Um, so, you know, money's going to get pulled out of that. You've got um, a new edition or a new version of the game coming out. So a lot of people are just going to sit. They're not going to spend any money till the new edition comes out. And then they'll either purchase the new edition or they won't. Um, I, I don't care one way or another. Um, so, you know, like, obviously, like, 5e projects, like the one we have going right now, right, our, our Kickstarter, I'm sure it's going to be down because of that. Because people aren't sure whether they yeah. want to purchase a 5e book right now or not because they don't know what the future is going to hold. So um, we saw that last year. I, I don't I don't, I don't, doubt that at all. Um and I, I think that's all part of it. I mean, it, it's funny. We could we could talk about the 50th anniversary, anniversary of D&D, where Wizards of the Coast essentially is probably the worst ambassador for their own legacy, you know, for the own legacy of the game. Um, it's unreal, right? I mean, I, I, I can tell you right now, we're doing, I think we're doing more stuff 
um, based around old D and D in this calendar year, kind of celebrate. We're, well, I didn't want to. Uh, it's other stuff to talk about later on. But you know, this Holmes thing. You know, we're going to kind of use it as a celebration of 50 years of D and D. We've got a, a giant Palace of the Vampire Queen compilation coming up at the end of the year as part of our tribute to the 50 years of D and D. You know. I, there are people who have not, you know, have no connection to Wizards of the Coast who seem to be doing more for the 50th anniversary than the freaking company. They can't even get. I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, I, I don't want to bang on them all the time, but the, some of the stuff they do is just scratch your head. How did you not have all three of those core books ready to go for the beginning of this year when you knew the 50th was coming? It's not like you didn't know this was coming, and one of them is not even coming out this year. It's coming out next year. How? Uh, see, I, I have no problem. I have no problem banging on them, Bill, because that they're a professional corporation that have been in, in business a long, long time and should know how to deal with this. And, and it goes back to what Eric and I say all the time: is the company is no longer run by by gamers; it's run by Amazon and Microsoft execs. And that's that's yeah. how you kill a brand is by doing things like this and letting opportunities like this slip through your fingers when you should be making a statement about. <laughs> <laughs> I have my gong Jabbar. No, no, I'm waiting to be tapped in. <laughs> Do it. I have thoughts. Tap it in. All right. Yes. So let's talk about a few things. Give us your Number thoughts. one, let's talk about Hasbro's um, fiscal reporting, right? So first of all, Wizards of the Coast has been the cash cow for Hasbro for years, right? The, the dirtiest secret in Hasbro Hasbro's investor calls is that they don't want to reveal how much money, how much profit comes out of Hasbro or how much profit comes out of Wizards of the Coast, because if they did, the investors would start to demand that they divest it and immediately benefit from that, right? Which we so, had the, uh, that guy uh, last year, the year before, who was trying to do uh, the hostile uh, takeover of the board. That never have backing, but so, so, really aggressive stuff. Yeah. So, so more importantly, let's go back to the OGL. Let's go back to the OGL fiasco, right? And, and Do we have to? Yeah, we have to because I think that's the that's an that's an excellent example of how things are so bad at Wizards of the Coast. So, so a lot of the people that have now come over to Hasbro and are now running Wizards of the Coast are not from even inside the Hasbro organization. They are all from Amazon. And and these are people where budgetary concerns are not concerns. Right. They they literally worked for the world's largest company regarding distribution of retail products. Right. Their budgets are I mean, the budget of of most independent RPG publishers isn't even a decimal point to these people. And so the notion that the OGL changes were not contemplated doesn't stand scrutiny. Right. They took one look and said, our nearest competitor in the industry, in the entire field, is 20% of our sales, or 23%, or 19%, or whatever that number is that Pathfinder hits. They took one look at that and said, we can do whatever we all want. We are the biggest fish in this pond. And I think, I think, right, we are all gamers, right? And we all genuinely, earnestly believe, let's all pat ourselves on the back, when we all began feverishly canceling our D and D Beyond accounts, that got the attention of the mothership, because because what we want to believe, what we want to believe is that is that we know how most people have some fundamental understanding that that revenue stream is important to Wizards of the Coast slash Hasbro, and it is because when you have X number of thousand subscribers of D and D Beyond who you can then go to a bank and say, look at these healthy subscriber numbers, right? They're, they're tracking and they're going up and this is great, right? But I, I don't believe that that d d Beyond cancellations are where the come to Jesus moment came from. I think the come to Jesus moment came from, um, yeah, let's talk about licensing. Let's talk about guarantees for licensing. Let's talk about, hold on, <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, first mini monster series. I got a box right under my desk. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, that's sexy. 
And uh, and and at the end of the day, this is series two, right? Let me show you the most important thing right here. Kid Robot. Kid Robot makes plushies. Kid Robot makes all sorts of stuff for Wizards of the Coast. Under license. Sorry. They make all sorts of licensed products. They make the plushies. They make all this other stuff. Think about, think about um, Ultra Pro and the Magic Line and so on and so forth, right? So all these licensing deals come with guarantees. Oh, we promise you, you're going to make this much money. You're going to make this much money. Mm. Now, I want you to feel, I want you to think about what it must have been like to be a licensee during the OGL fiasco. And all of a sudden, Ooh. your focus groups are saying, when your focus groups are saying, Sales drop. That's odd. We're not selling nearly as many Beholder plushies as we were two weeks ago or a month ago. What the hell's going on? Focus group. We have their addresses. We have their information. Let's talk to the people. Let's see what they say. And literally the thing they say is, we hate the brand you're licensing, and we would rather die than spend money on it. <laughs> right? And so that happens, and then there's an oh poop moment. Oh, I've already sworn there's no shit moment. Oh, right? we always Yeah, hurts. but but really and truly Hasbro Hasbro now has to deal with what happens when Kid Robot, whatever the amount of money they've been promised they're going to make in licensing, right? There's a guarantee. There's a guarantee and by god if they don't hit that number, then Hasbro has to write them a check for whatever that is. And imagine every licensee for Dungeons and Dragons in the space of 2 weeks literally the bottom drops out of the market and the only thing they're hearing is we hate you we hate you we hate you we hate the brand we hate it we hate it we hate it we hate it and you call up hasbro and you say we have a problem right what did you do to your own brand and and this also ties directly into i, I we are all nostalgic all four of us in this in this right now are nostalgic people right look behind me there's plenty of nostalgia yeah. right there on the shelves and and all of us are nostalgic for the way things were. But they don't care, right? What they want to do is they have a vision of, of some form of Dungeons & Dragons that involves microtransactions. They have a vision of Dungeons & Dragons where the books are the unnecessary part and what you want is exactly what we're doing. We're all going to be connected virtually. And the notion of a bunch of grotty old guys sitting around at a table... This doesn't align to their vision. This doesn't align to their future profit centers. And so we know that, yeah, I mean, somebody somebody in the notes has been saying over and over again, well, you're going to announce a new edition, the sales are going to drop. You're going to announce a new edition, the sales are going to drop. Well, no shit, Sherlock, right? Because, yeah, but but that that's obvious. But... We're at we're at the watershed moment, and I had this conversation with Mike Merrill's, and had an oh, he, he, like it clicked for him when I told him. I said, "This is 1982, 83 all over again, right?" So just as as D and D hits this massive peak, right, where where we are all playing the same modules, we're all waiting for you know when is A four coming out? I need A four. When is A three and A four coming out? Right? I remember the summer when it came out, like. I got an A1 and A2 for Christmas, but God damn it, where's A3 and A4? We remember that, but then the market changed. And D&D &D was no longer, right? Because, because Call of Cthulhu came out in 83, 82 or 83, right? I think at 82. And it took about a year, and it took it, they had to get a tale of books beyond the box set. You know, it was Asylum. It was it was a few other things. By 1985, they were hitting on all gears. They published Massive Narlathotep in 84, I think. Um, and then Dreamlands and Gaslight Cthulhu box sets came out in 86, right? But, but the market exploded with all these other alternatives. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing an exact repeat of that cycle from the early 80s. D&D hits this massive groundswell. Right, all the things align. Fifth edition comes out. Fifth edition's easy to get into. Stranger Things makes it more, makes it cool for teenagers to play D and D. We have this massive surge into the market, but people are tired. People are tired of it, and people want something different. Like Call of Cthulhu. If Call, of, if I was Chaosium, 
I would be killing myself to get the most entry-friendly version of Call of Cthulhu into a store by June or July that I possibly could. If I was if I was Paizo, I would have had a war council, and I would have said, right, I don't ever want to hear another Path Grinder joke. I want the most streamlined version of Pathfinder that's going to be sexy enough to get people to look at this system that they have neglected for five years, eight years, however long you want to call it. How long has fifth edition been out? Seven years? Eight? Uh, right. I think, right? So Hasbro is irrelevant in this conversation. The management's not going to change. The lack of, of participation in the 50th anniversary of D&D, it, it's embarrassing. But frankly, I'm not surprised by it. I'm not surprised by it in, in any way, shape, or form because to them, that's looking backwards. They just want to look forwards. And and when you look at the projects, you know, I, I saw there's another retro module compilation coming that's going to have um, uh, Barrier Peaks in it and, and a couple of others. There's six adventures in it. It's like Yawning Portal again. Yep. Um, I, I don't. I don't care. No, they don't have, I have multiple idea. copies they don't of, have a new of idea. Barrier Peak. And and frankly, I'll get it at 70, 60 percent off the way we might have all gotten um Spelljammer and so on after Amazon cratered it after two weeks. Jim, this is this is one of the things that drives me crazy. This same company will denigrate the people who started this hobby by by putting warnings on their books, yet whenever they want something they go right back to the well and republish tomb of horrors extra to the Barry peaks white plume mountain even though they will denigrate these people and say that we no but, longer believe what they believe well, and because you know, you're, you're marrying two different issues though you're there, marrying two different and there, there are two paths here you're you're right there is the what jim's talk, been talking about here is there there's this this corporate path that they put themselves on uh doing what they're doing exactly what what, what jim is saying but then there's this other path mike where they filled their company full of essentially activists and whether they did it intentionally or by accident, whatever it happened. So they brought a, a whole slew of people in who fit, you know, check boxes, whatever, whatever might have you that don't aren't necessarily talented um, or good for the game or anything. It doesn't, I don't even want to say that. They're just, they, they just, they're just not, they're just not talented. There's no talent there. The I, company's bereft of new ideas. So, these people, they all they, they keep going back to the well of look how shitty early D and D was trying to make their product look better. Mm -hmm. All at the same time, they can't come up with anything freaking new, and whatever they do come out with is garbage. So then they start, you know, some there's pressure is going to come from somewhere. Hey, we got to something's got to hit here. You guys got to start making some money. So what do they do? They reach into the bag of okay. Whatever adventure oh, module yeah. series and reprint it, and it, so, look, you're not going to get rid of that cycle to get rid of these people. And so let's 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 talk about the product first, and then I'll come back to the other point. You made two points, Mike, that I want to address. Number one is the number one thing I would talk about is the re-release of old models. So so it makes perfect sense if you own something, and how long has it been since S3 was in print? The last version of S3 that was in print was in the collected S module book that was published in 88 or 89, I think. I don't think of right. another. Uh, there's not been another version of, of S3 in any shape or form G published games. except the, the for POD games or RPG drive through right? So, so they own that property. They own that intellectual property. And it makes perfect sense to me, and I don't fault them, for revisiting it, updating it, and bringing it out for fifth edition, because they did when they bought when they bought Wizards the same way Wizards bought TSR. They own that, and and frankly, I don't see them going back to this every ten years. Jesus, they've waited long enough. Sure, have at it. But well, I, I think they but, should leverage their old product. That's I mean, right. They should I'm, leverage. I, it. I'm I'm of the opinion that they should be doing that. That's right. So, but they so let me tell you it in a smart way, and they're not. Let me let me tell you about what we use. Uh, I'll speak to Games Workshop briefly. So, if you didn't know, I used to work for Games Workshop, and when we would do new models, right? So we would do a new tank, right? It's a Lehman Rust tank. It's cool, but but what we always tried to do, and we were very successful at, <coughs> was covering 
all of the tooling costs, every expense associated with creating the model in the initial release. And then we would have variations, right? With metal add-on bits, it would not be a Lehman Russ. It would be a Lehman Russ demolisher. It would not be a Camaro transport. It would be a Hellhound or a Basilisk or whatever. But the tooling costs for the plastic sprues had all been paid for in the initial release of the model. And so I, I think I think this makes perfect sense for them to go back. Now, now let's talk about ideology. I think I think the pendulum hath swung too far. And I think that there's a lot of people that are saying, okay, don't get me wrong, this is an industry that is filled with troublesome people. Um, every convention in this country, whatever it is, be it gaming, be it science fiction, whatever, has had a guest or people they have had to throw out. Um, I used to go to a Star Trek convention near where I lived in Baltimore. Um, they had a guest. If I said his name, you would know who he was. And they had had him at the show one time, but they had enough problems with him, he was blackballed. They would never, ever, ever have him at the show again. And if showrunners from other shows would say, hey, you know, who have been the great guests? And they would say things like, oh, my God, John DeLancey's amazing. Hugh shuts the bar down every night and he's the nicest guy in the world and he brings his family and you know there's no poon houndery there's there's none of the shenanigans he's amazing and they would be like okay well you got anybody that you've had problems with and they're like um yeah we don't talk about that and so the pendulum of of ideology I, I'm I'm of two I'm a I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna try to tap dance through a minefield here. Right? Um, I'm really a big believer that we have to have a big open table. I I want to play games with everybody. I want to play games with people who want to play at the table with me. And if it's a great game, I'm gonna stay. And if it's awful, I'm gonna get a headache and I'm gonna leave. But but we can't we can't exclude people who are just there to play. We all have had games where somebody has stomped all over other people or bulldozed people or tried to tell them what to do, and they have made them, they have been unsociable at our table. And we have asked these people to leave. You know, I, I'm a beer and pretzels war gamer, right? If I'm not having fun and I'm not rolling dice, I'm not having a good time, and it's one person's fault, I'm going to ask that person to leave. And so there are a lot of things that, that, get talked about around wizards, but let, let's talk about Janelle. Let's have a very honest conversation, right? Janelle was not always Janelle. Does that matter? No, right? The Janelle, I never met Janelle until I came to North Texas. And Janelle was amazing. I, I have a ton of Janelle's prior work from, from, from Judges Guild. And, and I'm ready, you know, if you want to pick on Janelle, I'm ready to fight. Sure, let's go. You may beat the shit out of me, but I'm going to bite your ankle on the way down, right? I will. I will absolutely have that fight. Um, but does that mean that I want to be attacked all the time because I happen to fit a demographic, and that's where a lot of the early demographic sits for role playing? Okay, you know, you want to talk about that demographic? Let's talk about model railroading. Oh, <laughs> right here. One second. <sighs> Trust me. I know of what I speak. <laughs> right? Wow, well, Lionel too. <laughs> and and so let me let me talk to that, right? I I can't change who I am. And I would never ask other people to change who they are. But I don't believe that you help your audience and you help your position by always being on the attack. You know, I, I worked for Gaines Workshop. <laughs> I've been called every name in the book by people and I've heard every awful joke you can make. But Gaines Workshop is the only company that employs a studio full time with as many people as it does who create some of the world's best gaming products and who have never gone through the Christmas layoffs that Hasbro has put people through. year after year after yeah. year. And so I, I would say Hasbro and Wizards 
I think there are a lot of great things that have come out of making sure that 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 what we are offering people is a wider and wider and wider experience, right? Let's have a bigger table. Let's have more people at the table. There are more women playing role-playing games now than have ever played role-playing games in the history of role-playing games. We can go back 50 years. Um, and I don't think that's a bad thing, right? Let's Let's be clear about that. But I also don't want to open up a book and feel like the people who are making the products don't want me to play. Because at no point have I ever said, I don't want you in my auction because you are a brunette. Or I don't want you rolling dice at my table because, you know, you have one eyebrow and it doesn't stop, right? I, I find all of this just awful. I think this is just terrible. And, and the thing that came out of the 50th anniversary of D&D for me, right? I'm at GaryCon, right? And I played for a couple of days um, with some friends on Monday and Tuesday. And then I came up to the show. And, and I had, like, the last six, seven weeks have sucked, right? I got laid off. But I got a chance to try to put all that behind me and spend time with the people I really care about. Now, Bill wasn't there and Eric wasn't there. But, Mike, I saw you. I saw all these people that I see at, at three or four shows a year. And 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 I I put people through a real interesting exercise on all of this, which is okay, if if Gary or Dave had not come together to to create what we know of as D D, it might be something else, right? It might have been tunnels and trolls. It might have been something else. But but Gary had Gary got it out of the gate first. But the biggest thing I've gotten from Dungeons and Dragons is I got it for my birthday. I got the Holmes box set for my birthday, and I got a copy of D1, which is why, even though it shouldn't be, D1 is one of my favorite models. Um, but what did it get me? It got me into a group of friends in seventh grade. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in fifth grade, my friend Keith Craycraft, who is still one of my best friends. Uh, a group of people, including folks named Scott Wilson, Bob Hornbuckle, and some other guys, um, they're shared, you know, the DMs used to rotate, and, and and so that campaign world only came to an end like five or six years ago. It started somewhere around 82, 83, somewhere in there. And Scott Wilson, this is your moment of, of fame, because Scott Scott had different colored orcs. If they were blue, they were frost orcs. If they were red, they were flame orcs. Scott was not the most original person with his orcs, but that was Scott's deal. And and I got to know all those guys. And I would not have known them without him. And then let's talk about how it changed my life, right? I I it, it gatewayed me into discovering about miniatures. And John Carter, Warlord of Mars. I got the SPI game for Christmas. Um, you know, Warhammer. I ended up working at Gaines Workshop. The only reason I got to go to, to Gen Con in 1993 for the first time was because of my working at the Armory in 1993. You know, I was there. I was there in Dallas, Fort Worth, when they opened the first crates of Magic cards, the Alphas that came over from Carta Monday for the show. Um, the last 30 years of my life, the last 40 years of my life, have been fundamentally changed by the advent of Dungeons & Dragons. The friends I'm speaking to right now, the three of you, all of this, if I didn't have it, right, I can look around my office at all of the art, at my TSR rack, at all this stuff that I've been boxing and trying to index and so on. I wouldn't have any of that in my life. Maybe I'd have some different form of it, but, but if Wizards feels that, if Wizards feels that alienating its customer base or elements of its customer base because they don't fit in. Um, yeah, you know what? Come on, right? We all have heard the story. Uh, one of my first Gary Cons, we had a celebrity Hyperborea game. And there is a regular attendee of Gary Con and other conventions who decided to set out to absolutely ruin the game for other people, right? He's killed Mark Greenberg in almost every game he's ever played in with Mark Greenberg. Mm. And he decides to charge the Frost Giants by himself. And the Frost Giants kill him. And then Talanian's like, he's like, well, aren't you going to resurrect me back? And Talanian's like, you charge the Frost Giants. Nobody made you do it. Everybody in the party told you to not do it. You're dead. <laughs> what am I going to do? You get to sit there and watch the rest of the game. Um, I I've always found the Forkwits 
solve themselves. They out themselves. You know, the, the people who are horrible people will out themselves, and we don't have to have them at the table. Um, think about the people, Mike, think about the people you've ever had to throw out of North Texas. I'm sure it's less than a handful, but I would be willing to bet the peckerheads still are in your memory for being peckerheads. Um, I, I, I'm a 55-year-old white guy, married with a kid. Um, am I the dynamic of who most of 5th edition sold to? I have no idea, but I doubt it. Um, but there's a lot of guys that look like me, right? There are a lot of guys like me who are so thrilled that their kids got involved with D&D in some way, shape, or form, that the pride we felt when we saw them running their first D&D game because we shared that with them and they picked it up and, and took the baton and ran. You know, Bill has been. And the two of them have done amazing things. North Texas is not about... North Texas isn't about celebrating um, an exclusionary part of our hobby, right? It isn't. North Texas' focus is on the early roots of our hobby as far as our gaming goes. But, but for the most part, it doesn't matter. You, you could paint yourself blue and identify as a cell phone, and there's a place at the table for you as long as you're not a jackass. And, and that's the thing that matters to me. That's the thing that matters to me more than anything else. And, and I don't know why, I don't know why we have a society that seems to rush to exclusionary statements. Diversity well, is, yeah. And diversity is not a bad thing, right? My no, wife, of course not. It's because some people believe that by excluding one group of people, it makes another group of people who might already be part of their, organization or their customer base, it makes it, they think that that group is going to grow larger than the group they're trying to uh, get rid of. And, and it's an awful thought process. I don't know where the adults were when wizards decided to go on this room, but they're still obviously still not there. Um, but, you know, alienating the people, like you can't, I think we talked about this last week a little bit, you know, you can't choose the demographic of your customer base. Your, your customer base is going to be what your customer base is. And you really shouldn't care what the demographic is of your customer base. Now, could you do everything you could to expand it? Sure. But you don't do that by alienating a portion of your customer base. It's idiotic. It's, it's nonsensical. But it's exactly what they're doing. And for whatever reason, they think they're going to be successful by it. Be, again, just because D&D blew up. We all knew it blew up with 5e. It got so huge and it brought a group of people in at Wizards who all of a sudden now probably aren't qualified to be there, but now they have this giant voice through D&D &D that they can um, exact what they feel the customer base should be. Not what it is, but what it should be and where they want to take it. And you, can, you just can't do it. There's no company in the world that's ever been successful at doing that. But it doesn't matter because some people just believe they're true believers in that. They're never going to change their opinion. They're these these guys, these old white guys who are around. They're, they're no good. We need to get rid of them. It, it's absolutely ridiculous. I was around in the 70s. I helped run conventions starting in 1978. There was never a sign at the door that said, we don't want – if you – Fit any of these demographics, we don't want you here. That never existed. It, so, it didn't. So, Conventions so, were to bring more people in, not less people. And for again, for these revisionists to look back and say there was something wrong with all these old white guys back in the day. That's why only white guys play DD. That's not but, true. The Democrats, Bill, how, Bill how, how, how happy? How happy was your group when you finally got females to play? We oh, were yeah. so well, freaking happy. We were right. like having a party. What would you like? Right. What would you would you like snacks? Would you like? So, no, we never ever said it is a revisionist history. Absolutely, Bill, you're absolutely correct because I have never been part of a game when we said we do not want this. We, we don't want ooh girls. Yeah, no, never said or no, anybody. I've never heard, it. I've like, never heard it in my entire life. Right. Right. The okay. Never. You heard don't right. want the asshole. Right. the asshole guy is the asshole guy. It doesn't matter who he is. You don't want him at your table. But it didn't. No, he's not going to be at my table. Right. I don't think it mattered. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to just say one quick thing, and I'll get, and I'm going to pass the baton to Jim. 
I had a unique experience in my teens because I would spend summers and many weekends up in the Poconos, but I lived in New York City. So I had two gaming groups. And if I was exclusively gaming in the Poconos, I would believe that it was only white people that were gaming. Gaming in New York City, my group had Filipinos, Jews, Italians, <laughs> Greeks, uh, Blacks. Because that was the people, these are the people I went to school with. This is my, this is my crew. So, but if your only experience was being somewhere where only your type was there, and that's the experience that you believe everybody had, that, that's where a lot of this comes from. I don't think these are, I think these are people whose own experience was very sheltered. And Eric, I, I don't think most of them even experienced that. I think they're what Mike is saying. They, these are people who are probably in their 40s, never experienced that back oh, then. They're looking I mean, back. Yeah, they, 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 they never even played until, until they, they played. You think there's, you know, it's just, that's not who's there. The people that they've brought in. Look, corporations, when they start hiring people and you, you they form cultures, every company has a culture, right? It's just how it is. And you want that. You want a culture of excellence is what you want. But when you start bringing people in because you need to feel you feel that you need a demographic in your company. Well, when you start hiring those people for whatever reason you do, well, guess who those people are going to start hiring? They're going to hire people who are like themselves. And now all of a sudden you fill your company full of people who have a certain mindset. And that's what Wizards did. And it's it's so clear as the nose on your face. I mean, they filled their people full, the company full of activists and these people think that D&D &D should be played by a certain type of person. And that's it. And if you don't fit in that group, go away. We don't want you. Um, and that's how they, and, you know, it's unfortunate. And sooner or later, more adults will get into the room and this will, this will, this will go so, away. So let me, let me, I'm going to tag in, right? So let's talk yeah. about a few things. Um, so we play with, we start off when we're kids, we're playing with our friends and our friends are a product of the environment. And I will be the first person to say that Ashland, Kentucky was not perhaps the most racially diverse place in all of North America. Same, same place where I grew up. I grew up in, outside of Detroit, Metro Detroit. Sure. It was, it and, was and so I, I, I moved to Baltimore in 1993 from Ashland, Kentucky. And I can assure you that the racial demographics of the two areas were pretty much diametrically opposite of each other. Mm -hmm. And, and so I had a lot of culture shock um, and in a good way, right? It forces you out of your comfort. It forces you to open your mind to a lot of stuff and it, it forces you to really take a lot of this sort of stuff head on. And, and diversity, we need diversity of thought. We need diversity of opinion. Um, and, and the four of us have, have pretty much a very similar background in how we got involved in the hobby and so on. But, but my wife has spent her entire career in agriculture and, and her career was spent in what is best described as like many industries, a sausage fest. And, and there were time after time where even though she wasn't the smartest person in the room, she was the most prepared. Um, people still didn't want to believe what she was saying just because of who she was and what she was, which is a woman in a man's world. I've heard countless stories from her of all the sorts of awful things. And so when I read, when I read accounts of people who have run into awful situations at conventions, um, I take it both with a grain of salt, but I, I don't have a reason to disbelieve, disbelieve any of this, right? I, if you tell me you had a bad experience playing D and D and a bunch of guys laughed you out because of whatever race, religion, sex, I, I'm sorry. And that makes me sad. Um, I don't disbelieve it, but at the same time, I, I can't change the past. I can't fix that. I can only be better now, right? I can only be who I am now. And and I'm I want to sort of dovetail out of this because Joe Joe Manganella has this amazing documentary that he has been working on for the history of D and D. And I have no idea if we're we're going to see it. I hope we do. But he has talked about um, he has talked about a scene. Do you guys know who Tiffany Haddish is? Mm -hmm. okay. I do not. So yeah. Tiffany Haddish, that that your silo is here, Eric. I love you, but your silo is here. But if it was a little wider, you would know who she is. She is a a widely known, widely beloved African American comedian actress. She's she's a 
She's got a ton of talent, right? But she used to play D and D, and and Joe talked about this at Gary Con. He talked about how he interviewed Tiffany Haddish, and this is this is right. Instead of talking about old white guys and how the the hobby's filled with old white guys, this is the story that wizards should be just. This is what should be coming off the tops of the ramparts. Tiffany Haddish told Joe that. They helped her, her D&D club at school helped her learn to read. Um, the big show was talking at a dinner on Thursday night about how he and his friend, you know, they're in the middle of wherever he grew up and bored teenagers looking to burn shit down. And his friend's mom is like, oh, my God, I got to get them something to get them busy with something else besides who, being hoodlums. And she grabbed a, a D&D basic set and got them playing D&D. And when he went back to school after summer, he was better at math, he was better at reading, all of these things. And and I I don't believe our hobby is better by pointing out the random odd deficiencies of people we all recognize as jackasses. Let's celebrate. Let's celebrate the victories, like Tiffany Haddish. And these guys in her D and D club helping her learn how to read, or the big show figuring out how to do math because Thaco, holy crap, I have to do addition and subtraction right. and so on and so forth. Right, that's but the, the but, stuff but Jim, that's important. The, well, one of the problems is is we pretend like th they pretend like this only happens in D and I've seen a fist fight at a Star Trek convention over who was better, Shatner or Picard. I mean, there's bad behavior. Anytime you get fans together, and sure, fans right. is short, is short for why, it's for fanatic. You're a fanatic. Anytime you get fans together, you're going to have a certain percentage of bad behavior. I I know it must happen out there. I've never personally seen it, but I've talked to enough people to know that it does happen. But by focus, you're right. You're absolutely right, Jeff. By focusing on that, you are burying the good parts of our hobby. And, the, and the, let me just tell you, I got a personal experience will take just a minute or so. A few years ago, before COVID, we uh, Frog Eye Games did outreach to inner city schools looking for to play D and D. We, um, I talked to a lady who ran a class in St. Louis. These are high-risk kids who could not go home because there's nobody at their homes, and they are they are at danger if they go home. So they have clubs that go after school until 6 o'clock when their parents come home from work. I sent them a huge amount of material. Uh, most of it was uh, Swords and Wizardry, Swords and Wizardry Light, easy games to play. Um, she had over 60 people in her class. There was not one white kid there. Not one single white kid there. And they were all playing D&D &D after school. They didn't know anything about it until they started playing. This is before the movie. This is, I mean, this is just yep. playing D&D. &D. Yep. These are the kind of things we should celebrate. This is amazing. Yep. These kids, these were high-at-risk kids who were able to stay at school and do something fun. She said she had all the kids wanted to be a dungeon master. They thought that was the yep. coolest thing ever to create a world. That Those are the stories we focus on. Instead, we don't <clears throat> and, focus on those stories. And 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 let's let's be cognizant, right? So this, if you're still watching and you listen to me rant, let's be cognizant, right? Like one of the things that I think, I mean, I will say this: one of the things that was the best thing that Pathfinder did, and and Wizards did was um, NPCs. I'm sorry, PCs, but but the named character NPCs that are, that are at the heart of Pathfinder and so on reflect not just a bunch of white people, right? You go back to the early modules. And, and they're all European. They're all white European or dwarves that are white European and so on. Like really getting a little more diverse, you don't see it. You just don't. And, and okay, right? All right. But, but we, we have to recognize, we have to be smart <coughs> enough to recognize that there is a way to both include a larger demographic, but not do it in a way that insults a demographic. Right. And and I think the sooner we move past an obsession with with some of this and just get back to rolling dice, the better off we're going to be. That's that's what matters to me. That's what matters to me more than anything else. Um, well, and I, I, I sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish up, Jim. No, I, I just I'm not I'm too busy to get involved with fighting with strangers on the Internet. I really am. I just don't have time for it. I don't have the energy for it. I got other stuff that's more important. 
But that's see, that's I think that's was my kind of my whole point here is they as a company, I'm not so sure. I, I don't have any idea why you would care who is buying and playing your product. It yep. just doesn't freaking matter. OK, now that doesn't mean you can't say, hey, we're going to try to open our product up to more people because that's that's something that is is maybe important to the people running with this coast or they think they can get more market share, whatever, whatever, whatever reason. That, none of that should matter. No one should care, right? None of us on our end should care about any of that. But we do care about it because they felt the only way to do that was by alienating another demographic, that they could virtue signal their way in to another audience by slamming someone they know that, that the new audience doesn't like these people over here, doesn't like 50-year-old white guys, so we're going to slam 50-year-old white guys. And by the way, we're going to say all this stuff is problematic because we're going to virtue our signal way into a new demographic. It never works. It never will work. I, I can tell you right now, I mean, like, for example, like, you know, that that old chart in the DMG where, you know, uh, females have less strength and blah, 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 you know, whatever. They love pointing to stuff like that saying, well, see all these, all these people, they hated women back then and and they had these 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 rules that were that were misogynistic, blah blah blah. I'm sorry, I don't know anyone that played that who played D and D and used their gaming experience playing D to D and D to all of a sudden hate their mothers, hate their sisters, hate their nieces, hate their own daughters, hate their wives. Nobody ever said nobody, right? It, that was never. No one's ever done that. If you got a if, if you're already a misogynist, you're a misogynist. D&D didn't fucking do it to you, you, you know? So for them to claim that because there were these, these whatever rules back in a game, in a book that no one hardly ever looked at, that that somehow was a cultural phenomenon that all these people who played it must own and they must behave that way. And some, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous on its face. Bill, Bill, we have people that but no. I get this is my big problem with it. And I know we have to shut it down pretty quick here, but I wanted to say real quick. My problem is that we have people that were born in 1982 that are telling us how the game was played in the seventies and eighties. And they were not right. there. They no were not issue. there. And then right. they're telling us, well, this is how these guys used to play back then because they don't know that they didn't start playing until 1995 or whatever. They have no clue what it was like play back then, and they're sitting here telling us this is what it was like. These are the rules you guys used. This is what you did. Oh, no, okay. We, we, but we remember, didn't... remember, like in 1980, 12 year old Jim Kitchen was probably an awful D and D player, right? Oh, I wanted to kill the monsters with the treasure, right? I like I know this, right? And I can remember going to my first convention, and one of the guys who helped design. Um, some of the work for for SPI's John Carter of Mars was there, and I'm sure I was an irritating little shitbag, right? <laughs> I'm sure I pestered the living crap out of him. Um, I, I just know this, right? I can look back and go, oh god, I, I was just awful. Forty four years ago, I was just a shit. But that's okay, right? We grow out of that. But but it's the implications that this was by design exclusionary that we have to address and say, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, the Founding Fathers wrote a set of rules and they wrote some things into it, but, you know, <coughs> this will get into much larger arguments that I just don't think add anything to to the hobby, right? They just it, don't it does, it, it, not only does it not add anything, it takes away. Like yeah. I said, it, it, can, can any, do you know anyone that that decided – they were going to treat a different class of people a different way because of something they read in a D and D book, right? That was kind of my point. Like you have this chart in a DMG that says, you know, female characters have less strength, whatever, or, or whatever. Did any of you treat your mothers or sisters differently because there was some ab abstract rule in a D and D book? I'm pretty sure the answer is fucking no. The, yeah, but that they, yeah, uh... they want all everyone to believe that because there was this weird thing in a book. That we were all misogynists back in the day. Oh, it's, it's, no, it's no different than bad. It's no different than bad saying, "Well, because uh, oh, you, know, you still are." These by guys the play D and D. These guys, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just it's just bad. It's just bad all over again. Where they're saying, "Well, you know, because uh, D and D, these kids all killed themselves." And there's no proof. There was there was never any proof for that. But that's just something they threw out there, and they thought if they say it lot sure. loud enough and long right. enough, and in uh, again, it's it, like, 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 like let's let's address. Let's address the one. 
Yeah. Let's address the elephant in the corner of the room, right? I I don't know how to tell you all this, <laughs> but I'm fairly convinced that there might be some people in the role playing game playing community that that might be a little socially awkward. I'm just I'm throwing that out there. I don't no. mean to like I don't mean to like blow the tops off of some people's heads. But but one of the most valuable lessons I ever got was from, from one of my old supervisors at Games Workshop and he said, Jim, eighty percent of the people you deal with on a day to day basis have the have the have the maturity of a seventh grade. <laughs> that's that's and, not a and, and, and and like oh my god, the scales fall from my eyes, right? And really and truly I I I have been at the shows. I have, you know, how many of us have been in a room where somebody's like, um, you know, I'm in the SCA and I'm a really big deal. I've been in the SCA so long that I've risen to the top of my local, whatever the fiefdom or whatever, right? But but we've all been around these people. We've like, you know, I there is a very famous game designer who I was at a party in, at a Gen Con in 1994 and I was watching him hit on somebody, and he literally said, do you know who I am? And you're like, buddy, if you have to say, do I know who, do you know who I am? It isn't going well, but he still rode the rail out. He still rode the rail out. And, and, and I just, I know, in my heart of hearts, I know that a lot of what we, a lot of what gets examined as being evidence of how bad things are, in the hobby can very, very, very easily just pull the camera back and realize this is not, this is not intentional racism, misogyny, and so on. This is sheer ineptitude in a social setting by people who, who God, some of them are probably somewhere on the spectrum and really and truly their EQ is a zero. It's too small to be measured. Um, these are the people we have to help. These are the people we have to try to like, it's okay, but you know, <clears throat> don't, don't, don't comment on somebody's physical attributes when they sit down at the table. We don't do that. Well, why not? Them. Cause they're cute. Well, we don't do that. And if you do that again, I'm going to ask you to leave the table. Oh, I don't, I, okay. Okay. Fine. Right. Like these are the people we have to like, <sighs> every family has the successful ones the people who are happy, the people who are discontented. and Every family has the two or three that you'd wish never showed up at the reunions, but they're always the ones who are the first ones there. And, yeah. and we got a big tent. We got to put our arms around them and we got to make all of ourselves better. We just have to. Like, that's just it. That's it. That's all I got. I'm that's done. I, I, that's well said. Well, I have to say hi to Kurt Gould because he said hello to me, I think, a couple times. Hey, Kurt. Is Kurt Gould on? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Kurt. We well, sent you a picture, Kurt. Can't, 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 can't wait to see you in a couple months, buddy, for sure. <laughs> the pe can't come peppermint past pixie me. popped up too. The pixie is there. Is yes. peppermint oh, pixie yeah. here? No way. Yeah. 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 Peppermint pixie. God love her. Eric, Eric you want to sum it up? We're, we're over time. Uh, sum it up is that uh, this was such a lively show. We'll probably have to do this again sometime. You know, yeah, now that I'm unemployed, I, I, could, I have time. I, I can do oh. these things now. Hey, oh, hey, hey, go go back endless encounters for us. I'm gonna get in trouble if I don't say it again. My son will no, beat, no. Me with a, beat me with a okay. encounters. Bill, tell us oh, where to ba back it. Ba backer kit. Your backer kit crowdfunding. It's real easy. Eric, right. Right. There's there's there's, there's, there is a link on the bottom of the screen, which will link take it. you right link to the link it hard. Ten link it strong. Dot games slash wild. I mean, yeah, I love but, it. But but yeah, can I, I set the stage up? Gone wild, oh, but you know. Can I set the stage up for next year or next week? Can I set the stage up, next please, year. Eric? Please. Next, no, do it next, next year. year. I want you to go a whole year into the next future. Week. Next week. Yeah. Wait, you want to be back next, next week? Next year. Back? Wait, next year, the fifty-first anniversary. Oh, tell oh. me about the fifty-first anniversary. No, no, no. Hold on, hold on. I gotta, I gotta do this right. I gotta pull the camera back some. I gotta use all my, I gotta use all my motions. There, I pulled the camera back. <laughs> we have to talk about something spectacular. Uh. We have to talk about how we have we have reached the tenth anniversary of a fundraising project. Oh Jesus! Mary oh, I had something to say on that too. Oh my God, we didn't get to talk about that. I had 
I have so much to all say right. about that. All right, do we save that for next week? Mm, I had a lot we, to say Matt, about Mike, that. say what you were going to say, and that'll be the preview for next week. Mike, all right. Okay, preview, I'm preview. just going to say one, one line, one line, one line. <laughs> who's paying for this? Who's, who's paying for this? That's it. That's all I'm going to say. Because there's no money in the account. Uh, I'm sorry. That's, that's it. That's all I'm going to say. 10th anniversary. It's oh, been 10 years. And Far West is apparently shipping. I mean, that tells God, you. When the day has come that we can't talk about Far West and we have somebody else to talk about, ah, oh, the gifts, they come from God. All right. Well, I, folks, this, yeah. will, this will be a good one. All right. So we, <laughs> uh, buy your bricks. Don't buy your bricks, advance. folks. Get, get ready to buy your bricks. <laughs> bricks, are, bricks are coming. And, bricks and are go coming. back, Bill. Go back, Bill. Yes. Under, don't go, buy go, bricks. Go, go, go. Buy Bill's yeah. back kit. Yes. Back buy, kit. Don't buy, buy Bill's project that will actually ship. No kit. bricks. Say that five times fast. <laughs> buy Bill's <Go> backer <laughs> kit. Back buy Bill Bursch's project. Face Center Games. They do. They do. They do fundraisers, okay. and they actually ship the products as opposed to making you wait for ten years and getting nothing. Well, they, some people got miniatures. Mm. Uh, you got a cool picture of yourself doing kung fu stuff. So oh no, that's the, that's the far. That's, that's, that's the far. I'm um, talking far about a different one. That, that's, oh, that's, okay. that's, that's, we'll get there. We'll, we'll leave. We'll it. There. We'll, we can't go. We, we we can't get to that. We can't get to that. Too much. Too, much. too much to work we'll with. We'll never get off. Uh, I mean, too much. Whoa, whoa, whoa too much. phrasing. Uh, I'm no longer oh, 15. So what can I say? Oh, that's um, it. Thanks to Bill. Thanks to Gary. Thanks to Jim. Uh, this this turned into like a random party generator episode without fun. being a random party. This was we'll this this out. was great. Thanks for having me on again, guys. I appreciate yes, it. Definitely, uh, Mike. Uh, <laughs> maybe you'll be healthy by next week. Well, you know what, Jim and Bill saved my voice this week. Thank you so much, both of you, because uh, and uh, I'm ro- thank I'm you to your headset for surviving. <laughs> yes, my headset survived. It yeah, so uh, an hour, what, two hours. Well, I, I've got chaosium con next week, and I promise, hopefully, not to get oh, sick no. like you did. So uh, try to yeah, watch yourself, Bill. That's ugh. that should be fun. Well, we don't want it should be fun. All right, folks. Tentacles, tentacles, safe, tentacles. Safe you well. God bless. Roll those dice. Roll them well. If you're on Discord, we got to hang out tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Uh, live stream on Friday. Uh, Glenn and I, George DeRosa from. Uh, Oh, the Arduin Grimoire, uh, Emperor's well, Choice, will be on talking well, about Arduin Bloody Arduin, which are they're great guys. Out. Those are they're great guys. I love those guys. All right, folks. On that note, turtles. Thank you.